we're speaking about maverick scholars and people being looked upon as maverick, this is usually a, a term of um, negative uh, negativity to uh, try to ostracize them in, in some way. So there are a lot of um, people writing, um, I would call them aficionados who have taken up the cause and are publishing books on their own and through different means of uh, publishing at the moment. And this is uh, doing, uh, this is uh, making a fairly big impression on the internet. So it may turn out that what are called mavericks now in uh, generations to come, hopefully, um, can at least uh, be a counterweight to some of the scholarship. The scholarship, unfortunately, people in the field of of uh, studying these kind of documents, gospels and uh, other uh, materials of that kind, often come from seminaries or rabbinical institutions. And very often where the scrolls, the Dead Sea Scrolls were concerned, these were people who were under authority. So you really couldn't get uh, an objective view or to go beyond a certain point from them. They were they could go this far and no further, but they couldn't see, for instance, if you said the scrolls are really what Christianity was in Palestine, they couldn't go that far. I'm somewhat of a pessimist. I feel that the uh, authoritative documents are so authoritative in people's minds that even though new uh, points of view come into play, uh, it takes people maybe 30, 40 years of their life to develop these attitudes and uh, points of view. And it's very difficult to pass it on to a new, a new generation. So when young people or a new generation come up, they just start with the same documents that they had in the first place and the same authoritative points of view hold, hold sway. And I'm not sure if in 2100 or 2200, we won't be looking at the same allegiances that we're seeing now. We're speaking about the Messianic movement in Palestine. I think that uh, I coined that phrase uh, maybe back in the mid 80s, 19, uh, the 1980s, uh, because when we were looking at the Dead Sea Scrolls, people were using the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, to talk about Essenes. Uh, uh, occasionally they spoke about zealots. And this was a terminology that was uh, fairly normative and it meant certain things to people. But when you look at the scrolls themselves, uh, they were more than that. And the um, idea of an Essene as described, for instance, in the Jewish historian Josephus in the first century or his earlier contemporary Philo of, of Alexandria, also in the earlier first century, who spoke about Essenes. When you looked at these people, they were not talking about Essenes vis-a-vis -vis any um, Messiah situation. But if you look at the Qumran is the word we use to describe Dead Sea Scrolls, because it's an easier jargon, if you, it's where they were discovered. If you look at the Qumran documents, you'll see that they are full of uh, Messianic materials. Uh, they have all of the so-called Messianic prophecies. Uh, they have even have uh, collections of messianic proof texts, uh, promises, for instance, to the seed of David, and uh, things like that. So things that we've uh, come laterally after Christian Christianity came into play in the Roman Empire and Christian documents took over the Western worldview, uh, prophecies that we became familiar with as sort of, sort of proof texts you find in these lists in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So I began to call this the literature of the Messianic movement in Palestine. And that's why I use that phrase, not Essene, not Zealot, because um, uh, I don't think they called themselves Zealots. And um, we've never seen Essene used anywhere but just Jesus and Philo. We, we don't even have it in the New Testament documents. So what were they calling themselves? And uh, there are many names, but I think the whole literature is the literature of, because of these messianic uh, quotes, the literature of the messianic movement in Palestine. The key prophecy 
uh, that we're talking about when we're speaking about the messianic movement in Palestine is usually the star prophecy. It's from Numbers, uh, I think it's uh, Numbers 24. Um, a star will rise from Jacob, a scepter to rule the world, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, often, for instance, in Christian uh, iconography, you see the star over Bethlehem. If you go to the catacombs in Rome, you'll see Balaam, who's the prophet in Numbers, who is supposed to have first uttered this prophecy, uh, pointing at the star uh, in, in the actual catacombs. So uh, the, the fundamental one was the star prophecy, because of this star will rise out of Jacob, a scepter to rule the world. Now this is in Josephus. Uh, Josephus says that this was capable of uh, the first century Jewish historian, of multiple interpretations, and he, like rabbinic Judaism to follow him, uh, represents, let's say, the Pharisee approach. He uh, said uh, he, did, he used the most cynical interpretation. He applied it to the rise of the Roman emperor in Palestine, uh, the Roman emperor that destroyed the Jewish uh, uh, independent state in Palestine, that uh, uh, burned the temple, and so on and so forth. He said he's the world ruler that would come out of Palestine. And therefore, he, he in return, got the moniker Flavius Josephus, because the new emperors that came out of Palestine, the Roman generals, uh, Vespasian and Titus and so on, the Arch of Titus in Rome is still a extant, uh, these people were called Flavians. So in return for his uh, cynical interpretation and sycophantism, he becomes Flavius J Josephus. But Christianity, for instance, has this star prophecy as applying to their picture of Jesus. And in the scrolls, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the star prophecy is uh, referred to in at least three extant documents. One we call the Damascus document, one we call the War Scroll, and in this list of Messianic proof texts that I said. Now, that's quite incredible to have three. And Josephus at one moment in his uh, Jewish war book says that uh, the thing that most moved the Jews to re revolt against Rome was the prophecy that a world ruler would come out of Palestine. So, in other words, the war against Rome was a messianic war. So that's why I say that the scrolls are not only the literature of the messianic movement in Palestine, they're also the literature of the war against Rome. And you do have in this war scroll, a follow, it's in around, the scrolls are uh, divided into columns because they're read from right to left and so on in the normal Hebrew way because they're rolled on a scroll. So uh, around column 11 or so in the war scroll, you have this prophecy, and then they interpret it. And they interpret it in terms of the Messiah, and, the, and they also interpret it on, uh, in terms of the heavenly host coming on the clouds of heaven to rain judgment on all the world. Now, if you look in the New Testament, every time Jesus or John the Baptist or someone like that, in early church literature, James, the brother of, of uh, Jesus, is questioned, they speak about, and you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven, meaning with the heavenly host uh, for whatever they're supposed to do, rain judgment on, on the earth. And so I say that here's the war scroll giving its Palestinian version of these uh, ideas. And then in Christianity later, you have the reformulation as they're presented in the Gospels as we know them. Say that the Messiah, that the Jews were waiting for the Palestinian star prophecy, could be called the Christ. Well, can this Messiah be called the Christ? Um, the Christ is a, a very uh, ephemeral Greek uh, terminology that very few people know what it actually meant. Um, Christos in Greek can mean compassion. Uh, in some versions, I suppose it can mean anointed one. I've never seen how that actually works out because this is a very precise Greek uh, transcription. But one thing is sure, the book of Acts, which describes the development of the church in its own somewhat tendentious manner, at least the first 15 chapters, speaks around uh, 10, 11 or so on, that Christians 
were first called Christians in Paul's church in Antioch in northern Syria somewhere. There's a lot of discussion on which Antioch that is. I don't think we need to get into that here. It's very technical, but uh, the head of the Seleucid Empire, which is where all these Antiochs were, there were at least four or five of them, uh, his father was, uh, was named An Antiochus or Antiochus. And so he named lots of cities after him. So the question is, which one are we talking about? Which Antioch is Paul's Antioch? Uh, but in any case, th that means in the mid-50s, when this is supposed to be happening in the book of Acts, Christians were first called Christians at Antioch. That means they weren't called Christians in Palestine. That means in the 30s, 40s, or whatever, or certainly probably up to, because it would take quite a long time for that terminology then to permeate back into Palestine, if that's an accurate presentation, that means they weren't called Christians in, in um, Palestine until quite late, even probably until the war against Rome and thereafter. So what were they called? That's a Greek formulation. Uh, so I don't know if Christ is a, a, a perfect uh, translation of uh, Messiah or whether Christians were ever called Christians in Palestine until much later. So we have to ask, what were they called? And I think they were called, well, Messianists, perhaps, but uh, perhaps Ebionites. Ebion is the Hebrew word for poor, and the poor are mentioned in the War Scroll. The Dead Sea Scrolls call, talk about themselves in terms of the poor. Uh, the James community was called the Ebionites, the poor. The letter of James addresses the poor. And so that may have been one of the names. There's one early church historian. His name's called Hippolytus. There's a manuscript that was found attributed to him in Mount Athos in the 19th century that uh, was just recently found. We don't know if it was to him, but he has a, a version of the Jewish sects there, very much like Josephus, but slightly different than Josephus. And he speaks about there being four groups of Essenes, not one as in Josephus, but four. And two of these groups he calls Zealot Essenes and Sicarii Essenes. Now, I think that's more like what the Dead Sea Scrolls were. That this, the, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls exhibit Essene characteristics, Zealot characteristics, and Messianic characteristics. And Sicarii was a, a word is found in the Book of Acts 2. It's the Greek word for assassin or terrorist. And uh, Josephus, who's writing in Greek, likes to call the extreme nationalist partisan zealot groups Sicarii, uh, assassins, but they certainly didn't call themselves this. So that's a pejorative, again, uh, being used. And so you have to say, who are the Sicarii? In Josephus, the Sicarii actually are the ones who commit suicide on Masada when the whole uh, revolution against Rome fell. And in the New Testament, you have this odd character who we have recently found a gospel in his name called Judas Iscariot. And uh, people, you just transpose the I and the S and you get Sicarios. And uh, that's the closest thing that we have there uh, to, his, uh, to his name. So it's pretty clear to a lot of us that that's a parody of uh, Judas the Zealot, Judas the Sicarii, uh, et cetera. And then, of course, he's portrayed in the most negative way except in the New Gospel attributed to him where there seems to be a somewhat reportrayal of him and so on. So um, I don't know when Christ, Christ or Christian came into play. It's very late. It's overseas. It's Greek. If it's a precise translation of something, I don't know. But in Palestine, these are the groups we have. The poor, the Ebionites, the Essenes, the Zealots, the Essene Zealots, the Zealot Essenes, the Sicari Essenes, and so on and so forth. One last point I'd like to make on that particular uh, subject. Josephus says the Essenes participated in the war against Rome. Now, in his description of Essenes, you wouldn't get any idea because most people think of Essenes as retiring monastic sort of people. They weren't this, according to the Dead Sea Scrolls. They were very active and not retiring, and they were uh, aggressive and not self-effacing, and so on. Uh, militant, I, I would say. So he said they didn't mind dying any kind of death. They withstood any kind of torture. In other words, they were the first martyrs, just like early Christianity says Christians were. They were the first martyrs, and uh, they wouldn't 
they would not take the name, call any man Lord, or eat any fo forbidden thing. Hippolytus says the same thing, except he's speaking about the Zealot Essenes or the Sicarii Essenes. And he says the same thing that they would withstand any torture, go to their death, any kind of thing like that. But they would not eat things sacrificed to idols rather than for forbidden things. Well, if you look at all the Christian literature and you look at the book of Acts again, Acts 15, where the so-called Jerusalem Council is taking place, the final rulings by James are abstain from things sacrificed to idols. Now that is something James is portrayed as disseminating to the whole of early Christianity from his leadership in Jerusalem. Now you look at Paul, uh, 1 Corinthians 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12, he's heaping abuse on those people who abstain from things sacrificed to idols. He knows that eating and not eating or prohibiting eating things sacrificed to idols is a very important thing. And therefore he starts arguing all through 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 about this uh, this uh, stricture from obviously from James whom he opposes and he says oh an idol is nothing in the world you know these people's consciences are weak so because they have such weak consciences you know you're eating such things in, in front of them might cause them to um, stumble I'm paraphrasing here so when you're around them uh, don't do that because you don't want to cause your brother to stumble uh, but uh, as for me Later on in the same letter, he says, there are no forbidden things. Eat anything in the butcher shops. He also says some of these people in Romans, in the other letter, are so weak that they'll only eat vegetables. So <laughs> this is how he talks about this. And um, it shows that things sacrificed to idols and not eating them, what Josephus says, or rather Hippolytus, is, Josephus says, is what they were really not going to eat is extremely important. And kind of ties all these things together. Well, yes, the word Christ or Christians can uh, refer to the Palestine Messianic movement, um, but it's a later term uh, that has been used overseas in northern Syria, Acts, the book of Acts that describes the, its version of the growth of the what it calls the church, says Christians were first called Christians in Antioch in Syria. Now that is not a revolutionary uh, movement in Antioch in Syria, that's a Pauline church. They would be opposed basically to the Messianic movement in Palestine. They would be transforming it into something quite different, a pacifist, pro-Roman sort of uh, uh, Messianic movement that we're now all familiar with. So it isn't the same as the Messianic movement in Palestine. It's a, it's a later, uh, reformulation of the Messianic movement in Palestine. So yes, it can uh, certainly originally uh, refer to that, but that's not what it, what it became because the Pauline community in Antioch is very different from whatever could have been considered the Dead Sea Scrolls, the James community in uh, Jerusalem or anything like that. Let's move on to why the Jews rebelled from Rome in 66 CE. Were there statues that were trying to be placed in the temples and they didn't believe in them? Well, there was a revolt of the Jews ultimately in 66 CE or AD, depending on how you like to describe these dates. And as um, Josephus, the Jewish historian, puts it in the one revealing portion at the end of his book called The Jewish War, he says the thing that most moved the Jews' revolt against Ro Rome was an obscure prophecy from among their writings that a world ruler would come out of Palestine. Well, uh, we recognize that as what the Christian religion uh, considers its Christ or Christianity founder to be. Um, Josephus himself says in his own cynical way that they were mistaken about this, that it actually applied to the destroyer of the Jewish people in Palestine and the destroyer of the Jewish temple, the future emperor Vespasian and his son Titus, who uh, everyone knows from the Arch of Titus in Rome, where is pictured all the prisoners and uh, booty from uh, the war of 66. Now, this war in 66 went on from 66 to 70 
AD. And actually, the final stages of it are also described in Josephus in the Masada, which people have heard of, the Masada episode, which is a uh, um, sort of a uh, plateau or a um, one of those uh, uh, geographical features you see in Arizona and places, a, a sort of um, mesa, yeah, a mesa. Yeah, which is, uh, th th this Masada is, a, is a really a sort of mesa of the kind you're familiar with in places like Arizona, uh, on which was built a palace, a step palace, but also it had uh, storage bins and things like that. And he pictures the zealots, but the most extreme wing of the zealots, one of the Jewish parties, he considers, Josephus that is, responsible for the war against Rome, the Sicarii. This is where the Sicarii retreat to. Sicarii is a Greek term. Uh, it's uh, named after the, the knife, supposedly, that he says they carried under their vestments to assassinate their opponents. That's Josephus, who, who is already prejudiced because he's gone over to the Roman side. But that would be like the curved dagger Arabs even wear to this, to this day. Uh, they maybe have uh, used these uh, in various ways. But I'm sure they didn't call themselves Sicarii. Uh, that's a pejorative. But on this Masada, they're the ones who commit suicide with all their families and uh, children and everyone else rather than surrender to Rome. So that's the last stage of the war against Rome, 73 AD. So this war against Rome is 66 to 70. The temple is destroyed. There's a lot of discussion who did it, but clearly the Romans did it, burned it in 70 AD, and then it continues out in the Dead Sea area at Masada. But I think there's some numerology here. That 66, if you look at it carefully, is three and a half years after the death of James in 62. And I feel that the death of, the, I, I, in my work, I have um, uh, uh, described a, a sequentiality in these things, that uh, you have these Sicari or extreme zealots um, assassinating, collaborating priests. So, for instance, the picture in the New Testament, the Gospels, of the high priests and so on, condemning Jesus with the Roman authorities, etc., doesn't show you that the people, the general populace, was against this establishment. It shows, it uses this as a way of blaming the Jews in some way for the death of their savior and so on. And it doesn't give you the picture of unrest and um, um, uh, disaffection that existed in the general population. So the sequentiality is the, 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 the assassination of one of these uh, priests, the son of the priest pictured in the Gospels as taking part in the uh, trial of Jesus. Um, his name is Ananus, his name, and this one was called Jonathan. Then he's assassinated, then there is uh, a retribution on the Sicarii, probably, I think, the stoning of James, which follows that. Then the fire in Rome, which follows that. And then Nero's using of the fire in Rome, supposedly in Christian history, to um, incriminate Christians, but which is actually incriminating these Messianic zealot type people who are probably using the fire in Rome to uh, uh, answer the death of people like their leader, righteous people like James, and then this attempt by Nero to um, um, exacerbate the situation in Palestine and to uh, um, force the Jews to revolt against Rome so he could suppress and destroy them. That's the sequentiality I see. So the three and a half years after the death of, of, uh, of James is the year 66 where the lower priesthood stops sacrifice on behalf of the Roman emperor in the temple, which is the signal for the uprising against Rome. And that's a popular uprising across the board, except for establishment collaborationist groups. Collaborationist groups meaning the Herodians, the Herod family put in power in Palestine by the Romans, the Sadducees meaning the Romanizing and Herodian high priests, not the Dead Sea Scrolls or Jesus uh, uh, type of high priests, James type of uh, high priests, and the Pharisees, 
who are pictured as uh, ultimately their leader, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai in the Talmud, um, is pictured as also like Josephus, proclaiming uh, Vespasian as a messiah that would come out of Palestine to rule the world. And, and in return for that, not like Josephus, he wasn't made a Flavian. He was given a rabbinic academy in what's called Javne to found rabbinic Judaism. So, but the, this 66 is a very important date. The fire in Rome. Mike check, Mike check. No sound, no sound. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me see something. Exactly. Women's are contesting that area, but also North Africa. We know that there's a church in Egypt. We know that there's unrest in you Egypt. You mean Yahoo if y'all can hear that, fam? Cyrenaica, uh, Luke in the Book of Acts in the New Testament supposedly comes from uh, Cyrenaica, Lucius of Cyrene. Uh, which is present-day Libya. We know that after the war against Rome, uh, the uh, extreme zealots called the Sicarii and Josephus uh, move, uh, uh, moved down to Egypt. We know the Romans followed them there. We know that they burned this other temple that existed in Egypt at that time. They saw the temple and these groups as uh, part of this unrest. We know there were other revolts in uh, Cyrenaica that followed that. Um, we know there were, there were revolts in 115 that were put down in Egypt, and the Jewish community in Egypt was virtually wiped out. We know this from the papyrus trash heaps there. We know finally that there was the second Jewish revolt in 132 to 136 under Hadrian's period, in Hadrian's period, which was more horrific than perhaps the one in 66 to 70, but there was no Josephus to catalog it in the way we have it cataloged in the earlier time in Josephus, so we don't know as much about it, but it was uh, as devastating or more. So were the Romans afraid of this movement? Yes, the Romans were terribly afraid of this movement, were terribly afraid of this movement. Uh, did they, uh, would they rather have it uh, defanged, pacified, turned into something that was not as threatening? Yes, certainly they would have preferred such a, th such a thing. Was there a Roman secret service? Was there a Roman intelligence organization? Were there people in Rome who understood how these things were operating? I don't know, but there were very knowledgeable people in Rome. There were Herodian family members who were connected to the Roman establishment, both in Palestine and in Rome. Um, there were the very famous uh, philosopher Seneca, 
That was Nero's uh, tutor. We have an, ap an apocryphal correspondence between Paul and Seneca. We have Paul meeting Seneca's brother in the Book of Acts in Corinth, in um, Greece, a governor called Gallio. We know that Nero, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, was it Nero? Yes, forced Seneca to commit suicide at one point and so on. We have people who are very knowledgeable. And so I don't know. It just seems to me that when Paul and Josephus ultimately go to Rome, they don't get free in any way unless they are turned, unless they become uh, Roman instruments in some way. Josephus certainly becomes a Roman instrument after he goes to Rome in the 50s. He describes that he went to Rome to, on, on an appeal to Caesar. Uh, Paul also has an appeal to Caesar in the book of Acts. Something odd happens in Rome. We don't know what. He isn't seen maltreated according to Acts. And Acts uh, um, leaves off before it tells us what happens to him. Uh, in some versions of things, uh, there are characters very much like Paul that returned to Palestine at some point in the early 60s uh, uh, and uh, are sort of intermediaries. A, a character in Josephus called Salus, who I make a lot of in my work, Saul, Salus, Paul, and so on, who's an Herodian family member. I make a lot of him in my James, the brother of Jesus, in my New Testament code book, so uh, people can read about that if they want. But yes, I think the, there were people that were uh, ready to work for Rome uh, in these early movements, and uh, the pacification of the Messianic movement was very important to uh, Rome. Last point on that. In Romans 13, Paul says, the ruling authorities were placed here by God's will. Therefore, it's God's will that they are here. You should obey God's will. You should obey the ruling authorities. Well, you couldn't get a more, of course, it's a letter to the Romans. You couldn't get a more pro-Roman statement than that. And he goes on to say, and actually, you should pay your taxes to these authorities. Now, the tax question was the, was the burning question in, in Palestine, over which these revolutionary movements uh, began 50, 60, 70 years before he says, yes, you should pay your taxes, and the wearing of the sword will bring its own reward. And he bases this in the next uh, phrases in Romans 13 on one of the favorite passages of these Dead Sea Scroll type, uh, Jesus type, Messianic leader type uh, statements. That is, because you should love your neighbor as yourself. <laughs> you couldn't have a more cynical interpretation of the famous love your neighbor as yourself, what's called the righteousness commandment, as that includes paying your tax to Rome because you should that because they are your neighbors and you should love them as as yourself. You couldn't get more cynical. But you see, I'm not a great supporter of Paul. He yeah, he says some things that are really um, quite uh, worrisome if you look at them carefully and not just as an awestruck uh, person of faith. A lot of people are, are not really familiar with the Herodian family. They see King Herod as great. We are calling him Herod the, the Great. They see uh, King Herod as a Jewish king. Uh, this is preposterous. This shows how little historical information is actually being conveyed in the Gospels. Of course, we're not really dealing much with King Herod, except that all the members of the uh, Herod family became called Herod like all the members of the Caesar family, it became called Caesar in time. So it's very confusing to readers of the Gospels and the Book of Acts who the Herod is that they're talking about. But the first Herod, the King Herod, the one who died around 4th century or the turn of 4, 4, 4 BC or the turn of the eras, uh, uh, he, he was an Idumean Arab. And it's quite clear from the genealogies and so on that his father was a priest of Apollo, or his grandfather, from the city of uh, Ashkelon, Gaza area. Today, that's still called those names. And uh, that he had been either taken prisoner or taken over to Petra, which is in the Arab Transjordan area as it is now. And his mother was from Petra, was Arab background. So this uh, 
this is not a born Jewish family in any way, shape, or form. I don't know, hurting the Arabs. It's an Arab family. And uh, how are they king of the of the of the Jews? How do they become Judean kings? Because when the Romans conquered Palestine, they were looking for people who were aiding them, abetting them. And it turned out that Herod's father was one of the intermediaries who uh, par who, um, who um, participated in the Roman conquest of Palestine under Caesar's uh, 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 opponent, uh, Pompey, uh, in uh, 63 BC, when the temple was first stormed by a uh, Roman. So Herod's father was in that uh, process of bringing Roman troops into Palestine, and as such, he became the first governor of Palestine. And Josephus describes that these people became Roman citizens in perpetuity, his whole family. So all Herodians were Roman citizens. There later on, uh, three or four generations later, you get Paul or Silas. He's got a Roman citizenship. How has he got a Roman citizenship? In my work, one of the, that doesn't prove it, but one of the aspects of his being from this family is that he, he, he this is the reason he has a Roman citizenship. I'm sure Jesus didn't pull out a Roman citizenship. I'm sure James didn't pull out a Roman citizenship. I'm sure none of these people had Roman citizenships, only someone like Paul. He came from a very upper class family, probably of Herodian background. So who were the Herodians? They were a uh, Greco-Arab family, somewhat possibly Judaized, though only Judaized when it was convenient to please the subjects they were given who were put in power in Palestine and destroyed the previous Jewish ruling family, the Maccabean family, root and stalk, even though they used some of them to climb to power. So they uh, we, Josephus de describes how Herod destroyed uh, he, uh, um, his uh, uh, grandfather-in-law, who he had married a Maccabean princess, Herod did. Uh, he he uh, destroyed her father. He had her executed. He had his own children by her executed. Uh, he had her brother executed. He killed everyone in the family and destroyed the Jewish Maccabean family, who were the Jewish heroes of the resistance that the Hanukkah family, uh, that the Hanukkah celebration is presently uh, um, uh, celebrated after. So, who were the Herodians in Palestine? They were a Roman puppet rulership in Palestine, and the Romans used them elsewhere. They were perfect Roman civil servants. They used them in Asia Minor. They used them in northern Syria. They put them in kingships in Armenia. They put them in lots of different places. They were, they were, they were what the Romans would call kings of the peoples. That is, in the east, uh, the peoples were not part of the Roman Empire. They were little separate kingdoms. And often families like the Herodians were put in power. But these were people with total Roman allegiances. Actually, I had a professor uh, when I was young at college who used to say uh, poetry was uh, truer than, uh, than history. And uh, I think basically he was right about that. It isn't uh, what actually happened that really matters. It's what people uh, believe happened. And uh, the beliefs are in the old myths or in the old Greek legends or in the old Greek stories. Uh, somewhat he was applying it to that. But it's also in things like the Christian and somewhat even in the Jewish Bible. It, it's it, it's uh, what the myth, what the poetry says that matters, uh, not what actually actually happened. So each new generation, whatever you say, is going to hear the myth. And uh, uh, that's what is, that's what is uh, true for them. And uh, what follows is uh, uh, the actual history is much too complex for the average person to ever get their head around. The question of Jesus's existence is a very difficult one. I mean, people have been arguing about it since Albert Schweitzer's time and before. It's known as the quest for the historical um, Jesus. Uh, the point is, something what I was just talking about, poetry being truer than history. Uh, the poetry is very powerful. Uh, people people have, have love elements of the story that they are presented with. It's something that they believe in, they care about, and they uh, actually um, live their lives uh, by it. Um, 
the poetry for Christianity is in the Gospels, the four Gospels. In fact, if there's a competitive Gospel, like the Gospel of Judas that recently uh, uh, surfaced, that's rejected all, outright by the uh, down-the-line uh, believers. So it's in the it's in the Gospels. The poetry is there. So I don't think that Jesus can be historically um, uh, defended. Uh, I don't think there's any evidence that we can uh, that we can um, extend to that particular Jesus. I say to my uh, students and other associates and friends, the, actually the best evidence for the existence of Jesus is the fact that his, he had a brother called James. Now, we can document pretty, pretty good a lot of things about James because the, the material about James hasn't been mythologized to the same extent. It hasn't been overwritten with um, other people's ideas to the same extent. You know, in Islamic tradition, we have the Quran and so on, and then you have what's called the Hadith literature. That would be the poetry. Hadith is like news about the prophet. Hadith means news, like gospel literature. A vast literature of almost a huge amount of things being put into the prophet's mouth, some of which people say is authentic, a lot of which is inauthentic, people think, Western people. Muslims, of course, are like Orthodox Christians. They take it all as authentic. So um, the Gospels are, are like that, are like a, a Hadith literature. Um, the question is, how much of that can you rely on? Well, let me give two, two, two passages that I think, you know, show some of the character of this. Uh, some of the, what we call the synoptic Gospels, the three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that more or less resemble each other, John being somewhat different in some aspects and historical um, uh, um, development line. Um, you have this uh, passage uh, where Jesus, uh, I say it's pictured because I think that's all it is, a picture, um, spits in people's eyes in order to cure them of blindness or on their tongues or in their ears or however it is to, uh, to cure them of being deaf and dumb or something like that. Now, look, at those are the characteristics of Hellenistic, you know, uh, um, sort of literature, uh, healer kind of, uh, uh, I think, mythological characters. I don't think any of us in the modern 21st century want our Messiah to be spitting on people's tongues in order to stop them from being uh, tongue-tied or something, or spitting in their ears to stop them from being deaf and dumb. Those are the characteristics of Hellenistic literature. Uh, for instance, Jesus at one point in the same sequence, which is developing an attack on, on I think, Dead Sea Scrolls people. I could explain why, but I don't have time. But uh, that same pa set of passages in Matthew, Mark, and Luke uh, develops into something where Jesus say, is presented in Mark as saying, he said these things declaring all foods clean. Now, Declaring all foods clean is what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians when he starts on the thing sacrificed to idols and finally ends up uh, with, for me, there is nothing unlawful. All things are lawful. Eat all the food in the butcher shops. Uh, this is in the same passage where he's talking about um, not eating things sacrificed to idols. So uh, these passages end up with Jesus saying, um, he said these things, declaring all foods clean. But in the process, he says, or he's pictured as saying, in these arguments with the so-called Pharisees and so on, um, you should actually not have to wash your hands before eating. He says this. He says this. Now, I don't think the historical Jesus ever said any such thing. Why is he saying this? Because it's an attack on... Jewish Palestinian law of the Pauline type. So that is basically a Paul 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 Paul
my check my check one two one two let me know if i can be heard family let me know if i can be heard oh that's a sign to go ahead and get it cracking <laughs> uh, i always say we're chopping screwed a little taste huh good to see y'all in the building bless up y'all see the title nazarene edition for 105 history verse literature part two the palestinian background what we're going to be going over is uh uh like after the introduction the chapter i think it's chapter one and chapter two of the palestinian background and uh robert eisenman's book james the brother of jesus and the dead sea scrolls all right good to see y'all in the building you understand shout out to the haters jaw jackers and naysayers yeah 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 we love y'all too bless up bless up this is uh we're gonna be going over chapter one and chapter two of this that was old boy we had up on the screen teaches at the university of uh california long beach he may be retired by now you know what i mean y'all ain't got this check this out Robert Eisenman, James, the brother of Jesus in the Dead Sea Scrolls, volume one, the historical James, Paul, the enemy, and Jesus' brothers as apostles. Oh, we. Oh, we, we, we. Oh, we. Another good thing to dive into is the Dead Sea Scrolls, getting to some of that too. It's the Giza Vermees translation. Those are arguing over which translations is what, is what but. A lot of stuff he was talking about, like the war scroll, the temple scroll, the, all that's in there. You feel me? So, yeah, we're going to be going into that today. James, the brother of Jesus, and the Dead Sea Scrolls, volume one. How y'all doing in the building? Bless up. Good to see y'all. It's good to be seen. But let's go ahead and get to cooking. Let's go ahead and get to cooking. Let me pull a few things up. Bless up. Bless up. I see y'all in the building. I know I usually shout everybody out, you did, but look, the love is love. Believe that, know that. All right. Bless up, bless up. All right, let me present this real quick. So we can go ahead and work. We ain't here to play around. All right. We got the entire screen on this one. All right, where we going first? Hold on, let me make sure. Hold on one second, fine. Technical difficulties for a little quick second. Make sure you all the way on. Uh, I see your team 144 in the building. Oh, my bad. All right, so I just showed y'all the book cover, right? Get that if you get a chance to. All right. I think this is right here. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the intro. I got all them deals up. There you go. Let's say, yeah. No, I ain't tripping. The Palestinian background. So we going first. Let me check the chat. Make sure we go check. Let me check the chat real quick, fam. All right, we all good. All right, history verse literature part two. I know y'all want to shoot the messenger, but y'all be all right. Bunch of Millie Mouth Negroes getting mad. Panties in a bunch. Chapter one. All right. The downplaying of James and Christian tradition. Because a lot of us grew up not even knowing that who, who the world calls Jesus had family members. Matter of fact, let's get some of that first before we even 
show you how real this is. Stuff be right in your face the whole time. Don't nobody even say that. Let me go to her first. All right. Let's go show since everybody thinks it's a game. Dang. I'll show that first. We're going to slow cook this today. All right. We're going to slow cook it. Now we're going to go to Matthew the 13th chapter first. What do you mean Jesus had a brother? You must be smoking that good weed, Molly. <laughs> How many weed you smoking talking about Jesus had a brother? A lot of us grew up never knowing this. All right? It would be right in your face the whole time, man. Like, dang, that's cold. How something could be right smack dab in your face and you never even call it into question. You never even call it into question. Okay? Right here. Let's pull this up. Matthew 13. Dang, my bad. Matthew 13, uh, 53 on down. It says, and it came to pass that when Yahshua, or Jesus, had finished these parables, he departed thence. And when he was coming to his own country or his own part of Israel, his own land, where he from, he taught them in their synagogue. And so much that they were astonished and said, whence have this man, this wisdom and these mighty works. So they like, where he, where he getting all this understanding and, and, and power from, right? Verse 55, is not this the who? The carpenter's son, speaking on Joseph. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren? Look at this. James and Joseph and Simon or Simeon and Yahuda, Judah. These are his straight biological siblings. Look at this. You got sisters too. And his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then have this man all these things? So these, the people, when he comes into the synagogue and start breaking off, understanding way out of the stratosphere, they like, hold on, we know, dude. It's Joseph boy. All right? Them his brothers, James and them, run the names down. James is on the list. You get into the history, you start seeing, okay, and he was his successor. Yahshua's successor, if we're going to deal with this whole first century, historical setting and our best way to reconstruct it if you're talking about a historical jesus where well, he had historical family members james was his successor james's uh successor was simeon simeon bar but that's a whole nother topic but these are his relatives right here these are his siblings right now watch this let's just show you real quick so then when we go read the downplaying of james you can start seeing the you can start seeing the plot unfold. Like that was intentionally done. And now it's just on autopilot. All right. Meanwhile, everywhere you look, you know what I mean? It's pointing toward Yahshua's brother, James. That's who had the charge after Yahshua was murdered. And then James was murdered. And then Simeon Boyd then was murdered. And of course, John the Baptist was murdered. Like his whole family, like they was really about that life. It was really about that. The liberation of their people and all that. They like they wasn't rocking with, and I'm and I'm speaking historically. We all know what the Bible says. You know what I mean? But it's the difference between the history and the literature. You dig? The what is looking like is, is this is a more uh disciplined, militant family. This is a movement headed by a, a well-disciplined a well-regulated militant family that has been repackaged refurbished and given back to you uh, uh sympathetic toward wrong when you, when the dust settle when you, you get done with all the turns and all that the, what it's looking like is they didn't straight took this whole movement that was a major threat to the roman herodian establishment and and defeated it with information repackaged it with propaganda and put it back out you know what i mean it's crazy look at this it's not this is mark six and three it's not this the carpenter's son it's not this the carpenter the son of mary 
the brother of who? James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon. And are not his sisters here with us. And they were offended at him. So are we dealing with someone that had family, siblings, parents? We, we now, now since that's established and that's right there in the, the Bible that everybody read, right? Let's get into this. Let's get into this. You understand that James is the Messiah's biological brother. Matter of fact, if you think it's a gang, because I can hear a Millie Mouth Negro right now. Well, how do you know which, which James? And this James, and this, this, this James, there's a whole bunch of James. Okay. Let me share with y'all one more thing. Even the op of the movement had to admit what it was. All right. We're going to go to Galatians. <laughs> Galatians 1 and 19. This is easy work. We've been trying to slap you milly mouth Negroes across the mouth with it. Like, look, understand what this is, man. You're looking at this thing totally wrong. You know what I mean? Totally wrong. This is even this is even Saul of Tarsus. Look what he called James. Look. Galatians 1 and 19, but other of the apostles hmm, saw I none except or say James. So James is an apostle. The Lord or the masters, speaking of Yahshua's brother. Brother. Oh, we, we, we. Oh, we, we, we. We got to be serious about what's really going on here. Hmm? James is the Messiah's brother. So if we got Paul on record out of his own mouth saying he's in opposition to James and basically everybody who was left in charge of what it was. Who are we? You start seeing it's a whole nother agenda. All right, yes, James is the Messiah's brother. So let's get back to let's get back to the book we was reading. All right, there's three witnesses. All right, Matthew 13 and 55, Mark 6 and 3, and Galatians 1 and 19. James is the Messiah's bloodline biological brother. Now maybe pull the Nazarene lid out. I got that right here. Maybe pull that out. It's easy. What are you saying? And then her, they 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 lived amongst Nazarites and Essenes. That's why that's spelled Nazir. Nazirenes is a combination of Nazarites and Essenes. Really, that's what that's about. Really, that's what that's about. You know what I mean? Uh, it's up in the air if there was a historical Nazareth during the time, during that time. You know what I mean? But really, the Nazarene or Nazarene is a mixture of Nazarites and the Essenes. And as uh, the professor has said, there were many branches of the Essenes. It wasn't just one form of being an Essene. He was like, and he don't even like calling them that because there's no proof they called themselves that. But in here, James, you know what I mean? Messiah's brother. So it's all over once you understand that and you understand which way the movement was supposed to have been going, then you can be like, oh, okay. Okay, I see I, I see the you know the agenda and what they can't destroy by force because you can't deal with nobody like that. These brothers was with that and, and not afraid to die either and be martyred. You can't deal, you can't beat nothing like that with force. There's only one way to destroy that. You gotta deal beat that with propaganda through literature. The literature they did the black panthers the same way black panthers the same exact way they started you know what we're gonna destroy them with literature and they start putting out false propaganda about the movement now it's confusion in the mix i ain't know which way to look what's going on all right that's what rome did that's what rome did all right now let's get into this shout out to everybody in the chat bless up bless up let's get back to this now now that we know now that we know that the Messiah comes from a family and one of his siblings is named James. If y'all got that understanding, give me a nine up in the chat. All right. And now that we know that, he even got sisters. 
You dig? Chapter 5 in the Gospel of the Nazarenes give you their names. Yep, and the whole family was raised on the same on the same code. They weren't eating dead flesh. They wasn't they wasn't drinking wine. None of you. Like they was, like, they was bathing all the time. They was like with that. Like what did you say? You did, and they was in constant communication uh, with the angels and spirits and all that. So even a lot of the Essene uh, uh, understanding been packaged repackaged, refurbished, and then put back out. It's just everybody is just humming in the wilderness. Everybody just loves everybody. You know what I mean? They're like, nah, Jack, them bros, the real ones ain't make it out the war. That's all I'm saying. You did what survived the war was rabbinical Judaism or Phariseeism, which returned into the rabbinical, that's where your rabbis come from. And Pauline or Paul's version of Christianity. That's what survived. The real ones died. The brothers laid, they laid down. They refused to because it, it, it like a lot of us, a lot of us actually built like that. Like, we not about to let you just violate us. A lot of us built like that. And it just ain't in you to lay down and watch the butt naked statue of Caesar. In your temple, you like you're not gonna do that. So the, the the war was a messianic war, and it was fueled by the prophecy in Numbers 24 and 17 about a, a, a messianic figure ruler coming out of Palestine and being victorious. All right, your, your boy Josephus, Flavius Josephus, you know, what I mean, he get yellow in the gut. And, and and turn around and say that that's Vespasian of uh, Flavius Vespasian, Vespasian Caesar. That's how he got adopted into the Flavian family under the moniker Flavius Josephus. <laughs> straight sold out, <laughs> you know what I mean? It straight sold out, and then and then it was it's a famous rabbi, uh, uh, sitting not, not Simon Simon Johannin. He did the same thing. They, got, they snuck this nigga outside Jerusalem. You know what I mean? He come holler at Titus, the son of Vespasian. Like, you know what I mean? There's a prophecy amongst us that the rebels, the rebels are, are looking at wrong. Now, the rebels are those who are, who are messianic. They like, we not going for none of this. You know what I mean? Y'all not finna give us y'all God. We ain't paying taxes to y'all. We printing our own money, nigga. It's war. What the fuck y'all talking about? They did, but then you had the sellouts like, hold on, hold on, we all gonna die. So they did what they had to do. You know what I mean? You got your Josephus, he gets adopted into the Flavian family. You understand? He starts composing literature. Huh? <sighs> Good night. By the time the dust settled, your history coming from overseas in a foreign tongue. All right, then you got this famous rabbi and, and rabbinical Judaism. It was what survived. They gave this nigga an academy and all that. That's how Judaism survived the war in, in uh, 70 AD. They sold out. Dang. All the real ones died. That's who I represent. I don't represent none of this. Johnny come lately. Everybody, you understand? No, I don't, I don't represent none of that. I represent the ones that that, that laid their life down because they was like, nah, we not about to do that. That ain't even in us. You dig? We going to stand or we going to fall. But we going to choose our own destiny and rock on the out of here. We not about to even allow ourselves to be captured by y'all. You see what I'm saying? That's the atmosphere. That's what really was going on. All right? So look, that's who I represent. I don't represent this Western christianity this this western judaism that sold out and told vespasian this nigga was the messiah <laughs> you you can't be serious and then we read in in the gospels where we have no king but caesar at the uh so-called trial of jesus they telling you in there like jesus i can't and then come to find out, historically speaking, these niggas sold out, told Vespasian he was going to be Caesar. And, and that the, the prophecy in Numbers 24 and 17 about the Messiah applied to him. 
for that, Flavius Josephus is adopted into the Flavian court, the Flavian family. He is a court historiographer. Huh? He starts composing literature, writing histories. And this whole this Rabbi Simon Bar Yohanan, he uh he uh he was given academies and allowed to continue a passive form of what they call what you call Judaism today. That's what you got. The real ones died banging against it and standing against it. That's who I represent. I don't represent none of the sellouts. No, nah, not at all. None. All right, now let's get into this. I'm getting in and show y'all something. All right. Tie screen. Share screen. Now that we know that there's a family involved. See? There's a family involved here. No, nobody want to talk about that. Why not? Alright, so let's get this. Let's get this. Let's get this. Alright. Down chapter one. Chapter one. The downplaying of James and Christian tradition. In the period of Palestinian history ending with the destruction of the Second Temple. One of the most under-esteemed and certainly underestimated characters is James, the brother of Jesus. James has been systematically, you heard this. James has been systematically ignored by both Christian and Jewish scholars alike. Hmm? The latter, the Jewish scholars, hardly even haven't heard of him. His very existence being a source of embarrassment to them both. <laughs> Muslims, too, have never heard of him since their traditions were bequeathed to them by Christians and Jews. Like your traditions in Islam was given to you by Christians and Jews anyway. And if they are silent on him, then of course you're going to be silent on them too. Watch this. This silence surrounding James was not accidental. Augustine, y'all need to write down old St. Augustine. He was instrumental in the nativity scene and uh, in the Quran. Yep, St. Augustine. Look at the, the dates they give you. Look at them dates. Um, That's 354. He lived between... The uh the fourth the, the middle of the fourth and fifth century, three fifty four. Common era to four thirty common era. Look them up. The silence surrounding James was not accidental. Augustine, writing to his older contemporary Jerome, expressed his concern about problems between Peter and Paul. Signaled in Paul's letter to the Galatians, clearly they were directly connected to James's leadership in the early church. And his directives, he like, look, it's clear that Paul and Peter then fell out over what James then commanded. So who really is James if he's giving the the the, the heavy hitters, quote unquote, to speak, so to speak? He's giving them orders, huh? This man must be very instrumental and very important. All right, what if what you know is Christianity and Judaism, or even known today as being a messianic hebrew israelite or non-messianic hebrew or torah only israelite what if what you know is that took trip off this took a, a drastic left turn and only survived because it 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 pumped down or, or, or simmered down to the demands and dictates of rome meaning what y'all talking about ain't as radical and militant as you think and you'll never win no type of war, revolutionary war or take back the land of israel under that vibration It'll never happen. It'll never happen. If what you given it was repackaged, refurbished, and given to you in a foreign tongue from overseas by your enemies, including what you know is Torah only. I say you've been hoodwinked. Look at this. Look at this right here. It says, uh, but curiously, neither Augustine nor Jerome even mentioned James in this exchange. Exactly, but James is mentioned in Galatians by Paul. But, but, but when any theologian is speaking about the encounter between Peter and Paul, trip off this, they never bring up James. That's not an accident. That's not an accident. The early church theologian Eusebius, two sixty to three forty, had finalized the process of the downplaying of James, questioning the authenticity of the letter of James. 
Martin Luther, a thousand years later, felt that this letter should not have been included in the New Testament anyhow. And your boy Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, but Martin Luther that, uh, you know, that Lutherans come from. Look at this. Look at this. It is not surprising that these arbiters of Christian opinion in their day should have felt the way they did, because it is hard to consider the letter of James as Christian at all. <laughs> if we take as our yardstick the Gospels or Paul's letters, if we widen this interpretation somewhat to include the Eastern sectarian tendency referred to in early church literature as Ebion Night, a word deriving from an original Hebrew root meaning the poor, and other parallel currents like the who, Essenes, Nazarenes, Elkasites, and Manicheans, and even Islam, we discover a different story. Trim off this. For its part, the letter of James, in its essence, resembles nothing so much as the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is what I showed y'all earlier. We're going to start getting in some of this, too. This is a whole series I'm doing. History versus literature. We're going to be getting into some of the scrolls, too, because there's all type of community, community rules, and you know what I mean? They, they moved a certain way. But remember, all of them wasn't on the same page, either. You know what I mean? But they all moved a certain way. All right. They was totally against the establishment. And it makes sense now when you read certain histories about how James was a high priest. And you'd be like, well, how is that? When when Messiah come from Judah, so he would have been a Judite. You got to remember the whole priesthood was Herodians during their time. He like, look, they the ops. You understand? They the ops. So it wasn't no real Levitical priest. And if they was, they had been demoted down to uh, somebody that mopped the floor. You see what I'm saying? The Herodians had infiltrated the Sanhedrin. That's the courts. You know what I mean? The priesthood. It was imposter kings. Herod and his sons and them on the throne. Stop it. And they are the tax collectors for the Romans. Ooh-wee. Ooh-wee. Origin 185 to 254 railed against traditions giving James more prominence than he was prepared to accord him. Namely, those connecting James' death, not Jesus, to the fall of Jerusalem. See, historically speaking, a lot, that, that was a, a well-known tradition back then. Well-known. Well-known. Look at it. The normal scriptural view and popular theology to this day connects Jesus' death, not James, to the destruction of the temple. Origins' view of the tradition connecting the fall of Jerusalem to the death of James, which he credited to Josephus, is probably not a little connected with his disappearance from these materials as they have come down to it. I mean, they, they didn't even redacted and edited Josephus' work, man. You understand? Look at this. Eusebius contemptuously alluded to the poverty-stricken spirituality of the Ebionites or the Nazarenes or the Essenes, you know, different names and and all that, but when you get down to the core principles, it's really one and the same. A lot of it is, dig. I mean, so there's differences though. Look at this. It says, uh, it says right here, uh, who helps, about this, Eusebius contemptuously alluded to the poverty-stricken spirituality of the e Ebionites. So they poor, but they, they high in spirit, right? Sound familiar? Look at this. It says, who held James's name in such high esteem. He did so in the form of a pun on the Hebrew meaning of their name, the poor, thereby showing himself very knowledgeable about the meaning and consideration of James's person. The poor was already in use as an honorable form of self-designation by the community responsible for the Dead Sea Scrolls. As it was among those in contact with James's Jerusalem community, it was like, see, so they always they always linked up. Who who they call the rebels or the zealots in the desert in the wilderness? You understand? Or, and, and James's movement, which was Yahshua's movement, they always linked. They always linked. You see, and you got to realize, man, you got Rome. Rome is heavily vested into Jerusalem at that point. Right, the Herodians hold every key point of the nation. 
They control everything, the taxes, the, your, your spirituality, quote unquote, your sacrifices, all of it, your scrolls, all of it, your army. Wait, look at this right here. Okay, it says right here, the poor was already in use as an honorable form of self-designation by the community responsible for the Dead Sea Scrolls. As it as it was amongst those in contact with James's Jerusalem community, most notably Paul. The uses also figures prominently in both the Sermon on the Mount and the Gospel of Matthew, and in the letter attributed to James. The group or movement associated with James's name and teachings in Jerusalem is usually referred to as the Jerusalem Church or community, an English approximation for the Greek word ecclesia, which literally means assembly. It's also possible to refer to it as Palestinian Christianity, which would indeed be appropriate, but an even more popular notation one finds in the literature is Jewish Christianity. Let's go to page two. Go to page two. All right, we cooking. We cooking. I ain't gonna hold y'all long. We gonna work though. All right, top of page, page two. It says Jewish and Christian sectarianism. All right, y'all getting some understanding so far? Give me an eight up in the chat. Bless up, bless up. Let's work. Let's slow cook this deal. Shout out to the haters, y'all jackers and naysayers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We love y'all too. I know most of y'all probably gonna catch the uh the rebroadcast. So I gotta shout you out in real time. Gotta shout y'all out in real time. Believe that, know that. All right, we're getting some understanding. Cool. Sex such as these were at a very early time pronounced anathema by the rabbis. Mm -hmm. Ain't that something? You see, the, the very rabbis that, that, that sold out and, and told Vespasian that he was Messiah, that the Hebrew scriptures pointed to Vespasian, heathen Caesar, as the Messiah, the star that would come out of Israel, that would be victorious and rule the nations. So that was Vespasian Caesar. Oh, wait. So your form of Judaism that you got today is a product of a sellout. Good night. Look at this. It says, and a theme about the rabbis, the errors of the Pharisees pictured in the New Testament. Who took over Judaism by default? Who took over Judaism by default seven and a half years after James' judicial murder? You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> come on, man. The real ones died. The real ones died. Who survived with the sellouts? Look at this. After the destruction of the temple, theirs was the only Jewish tradition the Romans were willing to tolerate. Hmm? That rabbinical Judaism, that Phariseeism, the rabbis and all that. No, that look, the only thing that was tolerated by the Romans was that. Was that. <laughs> The realness. I'll show you the, the, the title of the book. The book is called James, the Brother of Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, Volume 1 by Robert Eisman. Look at it right here. After the destruction of the temple, theirs was the only Jewish tradition the Romans were willing to tolerate in Palestine. The legal tradition they inherited has come down, has come to be known as Halakha. And I know Millie Mouth Israelites call themselves mad at me for going into certain stuff that they don't agree with or approve of, right? And these niggas read stuff like the Halakha and Mishnah and the Tal, the Tal, I call it the Talmud. The Talmud. Negroes roll, they rushes. Every, every R is a rrr. You know what I mean? Just, just trying their best to sound holy and sound like something they ain't, you know what I mean? And come to find out, that's that form of Judaism that was tolerated. Cause y'all wasn't no threat. Y'all wasn't no threat to what it is. Look at this right here, man. <laughs> it says to be known as halakha, the sum total of religious law according according to the traditions of the Pharisees. 
It is preserved in the literature of the rabbis known as the Talmud. There it is. There it is. No matter what you got, whether you, oh, I'm Torah only Israelite. Uh, what we find it out is, look, don't none of that matter. Because what survived was those who were willing to tolerate Rome and pass them toward Rome. The real ones laid their lives down for it. The real ones was messianic. They was like, nah, 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 nah. We ain't going for that. We ain't going for that. The real ones ain't come outside and tell Vespasian Caesar. I, I, I just a bitch ass nigga. I can't get jicky with this. You the Messiah. Now the real ones was like, man, look, we gonna die. We gonna stand and we gonna fall. You understand? But what we ain't gonna do is bow and eat to that. You understand? That's who spirit I'm hearing. And I ain't hearing the spirit of, of the ones that bowed down and told Master and kissed Master's boot and was like, okay, okay. What you got today and Negro swear they so holy. You're not even realizing the war that's still being waged against you. You're not even realizing the difference between the literature and the history. You're not even realizing what level of propaganda is being played against you to keep you docile against these heathens. Look at this. This is all a byproduct of some sellouts. Who are we? And the same beast is still in power. Look at it. I said this includes what is also known as the oral law. I think it says mainly of a document compiled in the third century. Look at this. Called the Mishnah. I know it, Nick Rowe. The Mishnah, the Halakha, the Mishnah. The Talmud I said, Nick, bro, why is you trying to sound like you Jewish or something? Like, what is that? What is that? What is, what is you on? What kind of time is you on trying to sound like that? And look what look at this. The, the mission is a third century document. <laughs> man, what are we talking about here, man? Look at this. Look at this. Compiled to put together. In the third century, called the Mishnah, a number of commentaries on it and further traditional compilations, together known as either the Babylonian or Jerusalem Talmud, depending on whether they originated in where in Iraq or Palestine. Look at this. Let's get into it. The movement headed by James. I remember James is Yahshua's brother. All right, successor of Yahshua. When Yahshua was murdered, James took over. All right, now his the, the way he operated and moved is totally different than Saul of Tarsus. That's what survived the war. That's when they start formulating and putting the New Testament together. They go on with Paul. Why do you think the majority of the New Testament is Saul of Tarsus? Paul. Paul was against the apostles in them. He was against, against the family I just showed you. Yeah, sure, he was against that. Look at this. The movement headed by James from the 40s to the 60s CE in Jerusalem was the principal one of a number of groups categorizing the Talmud by the pejorative terminology, menem. This has now come to mean in Jewish tradition sectarian. He like, look, that was the revolutionaries. Hmm? Headed James. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We would look, Rome was scared of these brothers. Bros too spiritual and too militant. Scared of them. Very ingenuitive. Knew how to knew how to speak. Knew how to gather the masses. Knew how to rally the masses. But who knew who knew the whole time the very rebels and zealots that everybody talking bad about is actually the movement that Yahshua's brother was head of. Who knew that? Who knew that? Look at this. It says right here. <laughs> it says right here. With the gradual production of this rabbinical literature. Remember, y'all, we going what about this. History versus literature. This rabbinical literature, a new form of Judaism was formulated, no longer predicated on the temple. This became dominant in Palestine only after the Romans imposed it by brute force. You sell out, Negro. I'm, I'm Torah only. Now, the Romans had to enforce that form of what you call Judaism or Torah only by brute force. They ain't want no 
no type of hint other of the rebels, the bros and them, the messianics that was banging against Rome. They ain't want no smell of that leaking up nowhere. This thing is more disciplined and militant than you think. It's just the truth. It did when you look at it through a historical lens, you're like, oh no, nah, nah, you know, play play, playtime is over. Playtime is over. I'm not finna you're not finna sleep me around her. What's really going on? You dig, and as you start peeling them layers back, you be like, good night, boy. Good night. Makes sense. Makes sense. No, they change way more than some skin color. They change way more than a few names. <laughs> hey, if you really knew what was going on, you'd be pissed around her. Like, dang. You dig? Look at it. Because of his pal palpably more accommodating attitude towards <laughs> foreign rule. Look at this, man. Look at this. That's that. Man, that's what I'm saying. Stop trying to appear and holler at us as if you more holy than the next man, woman, and child. Stop it. When you got repackaged, refurbished, passive Judaism that was tolerated by the Romans and was spread amongst our people who wasn't going with it by brute force. You know, this, this was more accommodating towards foreign rule, you know, and at least while the temple was still standing, the high priest appointed by who? Foreigners or foreign controlled rulers. Who you talking about? The Sadducees? None of all was Herodians. What is you talking about? You saying the Sadducees was the priests and all them? Them was Herod and them. They was claiming to be the Zadokites. Zadok and them. Sadducee is a play on Zadok. They was the ops. What is you what is, what is you saying? Look, all the historians know it. There's only us that don't know it. Running around here thinking everything is just, you know, jippy. You don't know the game that's been played with your soul. You don't even know. You don't even know. Look at this right here. Prayer. <laughs> it says it was really only the it was really the only form of Jewish religious expression the Romans were willing to live with. The same was to hold true for the form of Christianity. We can refer to as Pauline or Paul's version, which was equally accommodating to Roman power. For his part, Paul proudly proclaimed his Pharisee roots. Philippians 3 and 5. Absolutely. And Paul tell you that he's related to the Herodians. The Herodians were appointed by the Romans. The Herodians had Roman citizenship. That's how Paul got Roman citizenship, all while claiming to be what? An Israelite. It's like Herod and them, they claimed an Israelite heritage. These cats was ops, man. If look, if you if somebody named Lawrence of Arabia, a white boy, can put on a garment and a turban and go into Saudi Arabia. Uh, and claim that he's an Arabian the whole time he's a white boy from the British Isles named Lawrence. Huh? If he can do that in the 20th century, look up Lawrence of Arabia to blow your mind. That's a British operative who used to dress like an Arab. If that can happen in the 20th century, early 1900s, surely, surely, you understand, 2,000 years ago, this thing was being done too. That easy. That easy. Look at this right here. Look at this right here. It says, this form of Judaism must be distinguished. Look at this. This form of Judaism must be distinguished from the more uh, variegated tapestry that characterized Jewish religious expression in Jesus and James' lifetimes. So he like it's a difference then what you got today and everybody talking about they going over their Torah portions and yeah look what you got to do has been repackaged refurbished you know, refurbished repackaged and allowed to uh, continue because of its uh, passivity toward the Roman powers. Now Rome came in and, I, and the real ones went to war and dropped behind. It. What you got now is is it, telling you to be docile little pets. Huh? Take what I give you and go on somewhere. 
and you dare not speak nothing, no word, nerd, close to any type of revolutionary something, you'll be marked. You'll be marked. Now look at this right here. This consisted of quite a number of groups before the fall of the temple, some of which were quite militant and aggressive, even apocalyptic. That is, having a concern for a highly emotive style of expression regarding the end time. <laughs> Most of these apocalyptic groups focused in one way or another on the temple. They were written out of Judaism. There it is. They wrote the, the real ones were written out. Well, you ain't heard about none of this. You ain't heard nothing about it. Hmm? They were written out of Judaism in the same manner that James and Jesus' other brothers were written out of Christianity. Look at this. Christianity, as we know it, developed in the West in contradistinction to the more variegated landscape that continued to characterize the East. It would be more proper to refer to Western Christianity at this point as Pauline or Gentile Christian. Let's just call it for what it is and stop playing games and loading it up with different titles. You talking about Paul's movement. Yeah, 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 yeah. Paul Light. Yeah, not, not Paul Light, but Paul Light. Little Saul of Tarsus. That's what you're talking about. You talking about Paul's movement? Mm, 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 mm. It came to be seen as orthodox largely. Look at this. I'm going to show you how you got what you got today. A lot of the a lot of the Messianic Israelites follow Paul unknown. Paul's your Messiah. Saul of Tarsus. A lot of it's unknown. Really don't know. You don't know the the, the level of propaganda that's been leveraged against you. Or even level. You don't even know. You haven't considered. Huh? Look at this. Look at this. It came to be seen as orthodox largely as a result of the efforts of who? You said he is. I got some of his work up there. Mm -hmm. Orthodox, mainstream Christianity. You know it today. And, and, and when you really know, when you know this stuff, and then you sit back and look at a Nick Rowe that's girded about the paps. I'm talking about all in on that Christianity, boy. It puts a certain spirit on the man. Yeah, 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 Jack, he real passive. He real passive. He, he, he slap fire out you, boy. At least the Israelites, even though they read, you know, certain things the same, and you know what I mean? At least most of the Israelites ain't gonna let you slap them. <laughs> it's gonna be a problem. You know what I mean? I'm just speaking on, on the black church. There, look, there's no coincidence that damn near every black man today in church is soft. They have a real docile, passive spirit. Ain't, this ain't no shot. I'm speaking on some facts. I got family in the church. Most of my family go to church. Real docile, though. Real passive. You understand? But it's not realizing uh, uh, you're passive and docile because of the propaganda machine, the war that's been waged against us. It's the only reason you put up with certain things. It did. And your enemy controls you with, with your fear of death. You understand? They didn't told you your chestnuts going to roast forever. <laughs> you like, oh, no. <laughs> I, better, I better just shut up and keep shoveling this, this dung. You know what I mean? Look at this right here. It says right here. It says, uh, it came to be seen as orthodox largely as a result of the efforts of Eusebius and like-minded persons who put the reorganization program ascribed to Constantine into effect. So really it was Constantine bishops that was the teeth behind all of it. Cats like Eusebius, right? It can also be usefully referred to as overseas or Hellenistic Christianity. Call it for what it is. Call it for what it is. You talking about that overseas stuff. You talking about Hellenistic Christianity. That was talking about, as opposed to Palestinian Christianity. His documents and credos were collected. Look at this. Talking about overseas, Gentile, or Paul's movement. Paul's movement. 
his documents and credos were collected and imposed on what is now known as the Christian to as the Christian word world. Read again. His documents and credos were collected and imposed on what is now known as the Christian world at the Council of Nicaea in 325 Common Era and others that followed in the fourth century and beyond. These formally asserted the divinity of Jesus and made it orthodox. So that's where Jesus was 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 put on a pedestal as as a worshipful God. Hmm. What a way to destroy a movement, though, boy. Huh? That a whole family is the head of. Huh? Destroy them all. Huh? Refurbish, repackage their literature. Give it back to them after they're conquered. <laughs> uh, and had them read about a pro-Roman passive, a passive messiah. Uh, that's going off on the Israelites, not the Romans. He's saying the Romans good for real. Like they, you know, many gonna come from the east and west, but you children of the kingdom gonna be same. That's where this is going, is letting you know, like, look, they took up the movement that was headed by a family, and this movement was so radical against Rome, it could tear Rome down from the foundation so they destroyed it through propaganda because you can't kill nobody like that. The spirit of somebody like that lives on. You see, so they got to do it through propaganda. All of us are victims of that war. All like That's where it starts for you. That war right there, the repercussions of that war have echoed the past 2,000 years. It has ripped through every civilization. So that ain't nothing to sneeze at. That's not nothing for you to look and say, oh, you know, wars happen all the time. You really don't know how, how far, how far the false gods went through their puppets huh, to sleep, you niggas. If you really knew, you'd be like, dang, that's messed up. All right. Look at this. Look at this right here. It says, uh, th these formally assert the divinity of Jesus and made it orthodox. Eusebius, Constantine's bishop and personal confidant, had a major role in the organization and guidance of the Council of Nicaea. The development, look at this, the development of this genre of overseas Christianity was actually concurrent and parallel, look at this, to the development of rabbinic Judaism. Really? Bang drop. Tell them boys I do this. What you mean? You mean the rabbinical Judaism and overseas or Hellenistic Christianity was developing concurrently together, parallel? Are you serious? Both were what? Passive toward Rome or allowed and tolerated by Rome. Even when Rome became a quote unquote Christian nation, still Judaism was what? Allowed. That form of Judaism. Bag drop. Look at this. <laughs> the development of this genre of overseas Christianity was actually concurrent and parallel to the development of rabbinic Judaism. Both were not only willing, look at this, both were not only willing to live with Roman power, they owed their continued existence to its sponsorship. Bag drop. What is we saying here? What are we even reading? Look at this. The development of this genre of overseas Christianity was actually concurrent and parallel to the development of rabbinic Judaism. Both. Hmm? So whether you Torah-only Israelite or Messianic Israelite that's down with Paul, both were not only willing to live with Roman power, they owed their continued existence to it's sponsorship, meaning Rome had to sponsor that. It's backed by Roman authority and Roman money. What are you talking about? One thing the bros knew that was fighting against Rome, they said, we can't fight them with their money. We can't fight them with their money. So they printed their own money for the liberation of Zion. We got the coins. Got the coins, show you the coins and all that. That's historical. 
Bros was banging, but they was messianic, though. See, that's what ain't nobody telling you. Oh, we. Yeah, that's what they saying, Jaja Boy G I T. So Vespasian is so Vespasian is Jeebus. Man, oh man. Man, oh man. Look at this. So there would be no Torah only or Messianic uh, if it wasn't for Rome. Mm. If it wasn't for Rome. They had to be more sympathetic because the, the real ones wasn't willing to, to be ruled by no Romans. Now nah, we good. We out of it. But they wasn't as radical as our brothers and them. So what they, their continued existence, they owed to Roman power and its sponsorship. Whew. That's a cold game right there. Look at this. To put this proposition somewhat differently, it was the fact of the power and brutality of Rome was operating in both traditions to drive out and declare heretical what many now refer to as Jewish Christianity or Ebionitism or Nazarene or the same. You understand? Look at that. Brutality of Rome tell you now nah, this is canon and this is pseudo. Mm, 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 mm. Look at this. What perhaps be a better description of it in Palestine and Judaism, what was left was a legalistic shadow. Look at this. This is what you got. What was left was a legalistic shadow of former glories, bereft of apocalyptic and messianic tendencies. And Christianity, a largely Hellenized, otherworldly. Look at this. Otherworldly, let me just page three, yep. Mystery coat. The the real religious legacy of 300 years of Roman religious genius and assimilation. This surgery was necessary if Christianity in the form we know it was to survive, since certain doctrines represented by James were distinctly opposed to those ultimately considered to be Christian. Now we cook it. Now we cooking. Give me a seven up in the chat if you can uh, get some understanding. Bless up. We reading James, the brother of Jesus, and the Dead Sea Scrolls by Robert Eisenman. Show the cover again for y'all. Anybody that need to see it again. That's the cover right there. That's volume one. Let me show y'all get some understanding. Bang, bang. Okay, we cooking, we cooking. All right, so that's what we read now, though. All right. All right, so let's get back to it. Back at it. All right, page three. James, the real successor to Jesus, not Peter. We, we. In the literature, James placed a successor to an inheritor of the mantle of his brother was largely taken over by the individual known in the West as Peter. This was a logical end of the legitimization of certain claims advanced by the now Hellenized and largely non-Jewish Gentile church at Rome, <laughs> following the destruction of the Jerusalem Center in the wake of the uprising against Rome. It is an interesting coincidence that the Jerusalem community of James, the Just, and the community at Qumran disappeared at about the same time. Yeah. Hmm? Though perhaps this is not so coincidental as it may seem. The rock terminology reflected in Peter's name and the imagery related to it were actually in use contemporaneously in Palestine in both the literature at Qumran and in what were probably the documents of the Jerusalem church. And the latter version of it was applied to James as well, probably to his successor, a man identified. Now, who came after James? It's about this. A man identified in the tradition as Jesus and therefore James, first cousin, Simeon bar Cleophas. Oh, man. So we got another bloodline relative. Hmm? We got another bloodline relative. Look at this. Who was over the movement? Look at this. We shall see that Simeon Bar Cleophas is very likely the second brother 
of Yahshua. Because remember, Simon was on the list too. James, Simon, right? Robert Eisman, like, nah, Jack, like, who took over after after uh, James was another brother, Simon. But look at this. He said, we shall see that Simeon Bar Cleophas is very likely the second brother of Yahshua, an individual called Simon, and sometimes even Simon the Zealot, as presented in the Gospel Apostle List. Oh. Dang. Christianity in Palestine developing in something developing in something of the manner of an Islamic caliphate and a Shiite wanted that. That is one centered on the family of Jesus and familial succession. He like what was really happening was a it was a caliphate, the right to rule by bloodline. So it's saying telling you that the Messiah, when we read about his brothers and sisters, now you can understand through an historical lens that that was a revolutionary family. The whole family was with it. The whole family was with it. They was not just out in the past just humming. You understand? No, they was with it. They was with it. With whatever time Rome wanted to be on, they was with it. We gonna match energy then. It was with that. You dig? So he's saying it's a caliphate. Family rules. You you hear that in Islam today. Oh, it's a caliphate, but it just means that the family rules. You dig? And no wonder we open up the book of Acts in the 15th chapter and James, Yahshua's brother, is the one telling Paul, this is what you go teach. We, we. <clears throat> James is not only the key to a reconstruction of Jewish Christian history, he is also the key to the historical Jesus. Absolutely. Absolutely. You see, you want to find a historical Jesus, look for his brother, because there's plenty of information about James out there. It's just to the church, it's an embarrassment. How does this man have brothers and sisters? Oh, man, no, that was Joseph's children by another wife. Then you start coming out with literature that Joseph was in his 90s and Mary was 12. That's some crazy. Now, man, we done read through this stuff before. I've been like, hold on, what? What you mean? Or, you know, the doctrine, the perpetual virginity. Huh? Pro Viangeline, we used to read that the Pro Viangeline proved Mary was a virgin and all that. You ain't, the, but the Pro Viangeline is the means the perpetual. Another title of subtitle of it is the perpetual virginity of Mary, meaning she was a virgin her whole life. So it would make sense to Roman authorities who's pushing that, you know, Jesus doesn't have brothers and sisters or a earthly father at all. It would dig for them to start throwing titles like, oh, half brother, not a real brother. Oh, Joseph must have had them children from another wife. And then he got with Mary, you know what I mean, who was 12. And then, you know, yeah, I don't read the text. I don't read the, the you know, the God, the gospel of uh, uh, Mary and infancy stories of Jesus. And I don't read all that. The Apostles' Creed. Yeah. Yeah, but he's saying that if you want to find the historical Jesus, connect with the historical giant giants was his brother look at this the solution to this problem has evaded observers for so long primarily because they have attempted to approach it through the eyes and religious legacy of james's arch rifle and sometimes religious enemy paul I don't get talking about paul boy nigga will be about ready to kill you and that's how you know now you pause your pause your mans that's your mans in there hmm it is through James that we are on the safest ground in approaching the historically accurate semblance of what Jesus himself, insofar as he actually existed, might have been like. Of all the characters in the early stages of Christianity, Paul alone is known to us through firsthand autobiographical documents. That is, the genuine letters attributed to him. They reveal his life, character, and thought in the most personal manner possible. Hmm. So he's like, look, look at Paul's letters. So I'm like, man, so you saying take out Paul's letters? It's no good. No, nah, leave him in there. Leave him in there because he telling on himself the whole time. Just we too busy precepting everything. You ain't slow down and reread it. Slow down and read through the whole thing. You be like, dang, that's crazy. Look at this. 
It says right here, uh, all others, all others, even Jesus and most of those generally called apostles, we know only by second or third hand accounts. You never tripped off that, did you? It's not written in first hand account. The Gospels are not written in first hand account. You understand? At all. Nothing about the apostles is. <laughs> the only first hand accounts you got in the New Testament is Paul's letters. The ones that are attributed to him. Ain't that something? Wow. All of all others, even Jesus and most of those generally called apostles, we know only by second or third hand accounts. If we know if we know them at all, we have gospels or letters purportedly written about them or in their names. But these must be handed with the utmost care. It also it also not generally comprehended that this is the sequence in which we should take the New Testament. Listen to this. Paul's genuine letters and a few other materials. Why? Because when you look up the chronological New Testament. When it comes down to who was writing first. I ain't talking about because Matthew was in there first. I'm talking about when were the letters and the documents written, right? Paul's letters were actually written before the Gospels. Good night. What are we talking about? Here? The Gospels were written after the war, in, after the war in 70 AD. But Jesus supposedly died around 30 something AD, so 40 years early. Then you got the so 40 years later, you got one of the first Gospels coming up. But Paul is in the 40s and 50s right now. Good night. What is we talking about here? You mean to tell me Paul's letters, out of all the literature you got in the New Testament, Paul was the first one writing? Wow. Wow, wow, wow. That's it right here. Paul's genuine letters and a few other materials, possibly including the letter of James, come first and are primary. The rest come later and are what? Secondary. Secondary. The Gospels themselves are probably even tertiary. Biblical scholars have not come to a consensus on which aspects of this legacy can probably be considered historical, nor have they succeeded in giving us a very real picture of what might have occurred at this formative moment in human history or other events surrounding and succeeding the life of the individual called in the Hellenistic world, the Christ. When it comes to the person of Jesus' brother James, however, we are on much firmer ground not least because he has been so marginalized we have a number of facts concerning james's life attested to by a variety of independent observations within and without christian tradition it should be surprising it should not be surprising that the existence that the existence of an actual brother of jesus in the flesh was a problem for the theologian committed to ideas of divine sonship and supernatural birth in the Roman Catholic doctrine, it has been the received teaching since the end, since the end of the what? The fourth century. That James was the brother of Jesus, not only by a different father, an obvious necessity in view of the doctrine of divine sonship, but also by a different mother. The answer to the conundrum presented by the perpetual virginity of Mary. That is, James was a cousin of Jesus. Wow. See how they see, see how they start, they rewrite him out of there. They come up with the doctrines. And because the actual historical narrative don't fit your doctrine, you dig, you start spinning a brother into a cousin. Half brother. Look at this. It's uh two volumes of this, uh, the realness, or you can get it under one cover. If you get it under one cover, it's like, it's like right around a thousand pages. Look at it right here. It says right here. That is, James was the cousin of Jesus. We shall take this for what it is, embarrassment over the existence of Jesus' brothers and bids to protect the emerging doctrine of the supernatural Christ. Shit embarrassing. This, this started gaining, true about this, this started gaining currency in the second and third centuries, but was totally absent from contemporary documents relating to the family of Yahshua that survived the redaction process of the New Testament. Bad drop, boy. Good night. Good night. So, so when you heard his family was looking for him 
And he said, well, who is my mother and who is my brothers and all them? And you like, yeah, you did. Nah, nah, nah. History. He rocked with his family. Literature. See, that's that's propaganda. Because remember, the whole deal is to take down the leadership of this messianic movement. The leadership of the movement is Yahshua's family. So the literature, when, especially when the dust settles, the literature that comes out is aimed at uh, making docile that revolutionary spirit. That's the whole point. So now you got a Messiah saying, oh, my family, only those that do this, this, that, and that. Right? Meanwhile, this was a family that was well disciplined. You understand? Bodies was the temples. They were very thorough in, in, in their diet. You did. They weren't chewing on the back of animals. They weren't even drinking wine. Like these cats was really with that life. They wasn't cutting their hair. They was bathing several times a day. They was in communion with the forces. They, like, they was with life. You know what I mean? All that. They was healers. They was they was heavy into the science and all that. Yeah, they, they was like with with it and they was totally against the establishment that the romans had running jerusalem they was totally against that you see now look at this it says right here there is also so so again when he kind of in a sneak way diss his family or you read john 7 where it say neither did his brethren believe in him and all that all oh, that's wartime propaganda a post-war propaganda you understand to really write his family out of the equation and the docile, the revolutionary spirit. That's crazy. No, I'm sorry. I rock with his family. His whole family was with this. That ain't no coincidence. John the Baptist, cousin, Yahshua, James, brother, Simeon, boy, brother, all of them get killed by Herodians. I think that's a coincidence. Paul is telling you he a Herodian. He saluting people in Nero's court, Epaphroditus. That's his homeboy. Huh? He in Phil, he, he in Philippians. That's his homeboy. That's Nero's secretary. That's in Josephus. Hmm? He's saluting all those in Caesar's household and all type of stuff. What is we really talking about here? You think it's a coincidence the Herodian, the Roman-backed establishment that had the Herodians in every key position, you think that's a coincidence that all of them was murdered by them? Nah, man. Something else going on here, right? Look at this right here. There is also sufficient evidence to show James is a normative Jew of his time, even one referred to by the most extreme terminology, zealot or sakari. Like, look, John, they he like, man, it's a, it's a gang of evidence showing he wasn't playing. Like they they was not they was not corroborators with Rome. They uh, Rome and them is the ops. Herod and them the ops. We don't rock with them. You see. We, oui. this in spite of his being the most important of the central triad of early church leaders, whom Paul denotes as pillars, Galatians 2 and 9. What a normative Jew might have been in these circumstances before the fall of the temple will require further elucidation. For the purposes of discussion, we are on safe ground. However, if we say that such a concept at least encompasses an attachment to the law, it also consists of a feeling for temple and temple worship, regardless of attitude towards the Herodians pro-Roman priesthood overseeing it. Look at that. Hmm? The Herodian pro-Roman priesthood overseeing the temple. The priest was the ops, Herod and them. When you, who you read about Sadducees in the New Testament? Sadducees is a play on Zadok. They were calling themselves the sons of Zadok, but they was Herodians. It was Herodians. King was a Herodian, the priests were Herodians, majority of the Sanhedrin, Herodians. Scribes and all Herodians. What is we talking about? At some point in the mid 40s, Cephas and John, two of those Paul designates as pillars in Galatians 2 and 9, along with another James, the brother of John, as distinct from James, the subject of this book, disappear from the scene. Probably in the context of conflict with Herodian kings such as Agrippa I, hmm? 37 through 44, or his brother Herod Calchas, 44 through 49. Thus, James was left to occupy the Christian leadership stage in Palestine alone for the next two decades. At least this is what can be gleaned. 
from the materials and acts, however imprecise or mythologized they may be. So he, he's admitting when you read the, the text or the scriptures, there is mythology in there. Literature is, is mythology mixed with some history. This is what it is. Look at this. The direct appointment or election of James. Direct appointment or election of James. All right. Whether James succeeded to this leadership by direct appointment of Yahshua or he was elected by the apostles is disputed in the sources. However, he emerged such a succession seems to have been connected with the sequence of the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus to his disciples as depicted in the literature or as Eusebius puts it, following Clement of Alexandria, the order in which the, the tradition of knowledge was accorded individual leaders. There are lost resurrection traditions. There are lost resurrection traditions that have courted precedence even in this to James, despite attempts to obliterate them. One of these found in the first post-resurrection appearance episode in the Gospel of Luke depicts Jesus as appearing to Clopas, that is, Simeon Bar Cleophas, meaning one of his family members, either a cousin or a brother, or his father together with an unnamed companion, possibly James, on the Emmaus Road outside Jerusalem. Yeah, that's in Luke like 24. Yeah, yeah, look at this. A second is certainly to be found in 1 Corinthians 15 and 7, where Paul confirms an appearance to James and last of all himself. In the former, at least, if not in the latter, we have unassailable evidence of a tradition according to precedence in the matter of the first appearance to a member or members of Yahshua's family. Bag drop. What is we saying? Clopas, what about this Clopas according to existing tradition being at the very least Yahshua's uncle. At the least, right? Interesting, interestingly enough, this appearance takes place in the environs or the environment of Jerusalem. Not in Galilee as most other such gospel renditions. Yeah. In addition, other early traditions actually speak in terms of a direct appointment of James by Jesus, as opposed to this early church traditions via Clement mentioning an election of James. Whatever the conclusion, there can be no doubt that James was the actual successor in Palestine. Not Paul, not Peter, but James bloodline you understand blood related to yashua you see and and now yashua's movement ended up splitting right not even splitting it paul came with his own thing and when the dust settled that's who rome went with but paul knew the ogs and them he knew the apostles he knew that james was an apostle and the messiah's brother but he disagreed with them he disagreed with them and he made it known to his assemblies that he was, you know, writing to. He disagreed with them, and at times he cursed them. Yep, because such a false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the ministers of Christ. And no one, and no, don't marvel, because Satan himself, so he, he called them false apostles and say, you know, they, they don't, don't marvel, don't be surprised, Satan do the same thing as them, the apostles. Well, hold on. Who are the apostles he talking about? There's only 12 of them. You think that Paul ain't no apostle according to the Bible. He's not according to his own mouth, he, he is, but according to the Bible, the, the, the prerequisite, the requirements of being an apostle, Paul don't fit that. So, so off his own lips, James is an apostle, and the other apostles were in Jerusalem. So when he says such are false apostles, who you think he's talking about? Timothy. You think he talking about Geno Jennings? Ain't none of these men apostles. There's only 12 apostles. And you had to have been a witness of the immersion and resurrection the whole time and been around the whole time the Messiah went in and came out from amongst them. If not, you're not no apostle, period. So when Paul was calling, calling a set group of people and saying such are false apostles, listen to me, y'all. There's only one group of apostles, even according to him. 
outside of himself, there's only one group of apostles outside of himself, and those are the apostles. So that lets you know right there, he was talking about them. He was cursing them because what he he taught something different than them. So then when he telling the Galatians, like, look, if they bring you, if anybody, man or angel, bring you any other gospel than what we done preached, talking about him and his crew, count them cursed. And now he cursing them because he know that they teach something different than what he out there spewing. Who you think Paul talking about when he talk about the long hair? Brothers was Nazarites, a lot of them. Razor never touched their head. Hmm? Who you think he talking about when he talk about don't nature teach you that, that for a man to have long hair basically is wrong? Well, you got to be talking about them Nazarites then. Them brothers never cut that. A lot of them was lifelong Nazarites. Razor never touched their head. Who you think Paul talking about when he say those that eat herbs or eat vegetables are weak? Brothers was Nazarites once again. They weren't chewing on the back of animals either. Who you think Paul talking about when he talk about the involuntary worship of angels? Them brothers was in direct communion with angels. They That's what the whole thing about being pure and living a certain way was about. So they could tap into the unseen realm that's around them. And, and you understand? Prepare themselves. Paul got a problem with the bros. And, and that's just what it is and was always that. It's just we've been so, we've been spending so much of our time precepting and dancing all over the Bible instead of reading straight through. You'd be like, dang, hold on, there's something else going on here. All right? Yeah, none of these men or apostles today, none of them. All right? They don't fit the criteria. And at the most, you can be a, a student. A uh, long line succession of student of the teachings, but you ain't no apostle though. Now look at this right here. It says, uh, finally, finally, there is the letter ascribed to James in the New Testament, which Eusebius is considered spurious. Eusebius is a church father and historian. And he he in his day, in his fourth century, Eusebius was uh Constantine's bishop. All right, and he he think that the letter that's in there that's a uh, ascribed to James is false, spurious. Despite his Jewish apocalyptic character and in spite of his purportedly late appearance on the scene, hmm, it was evidently imbued with such prestige that it could not be excluded from the canon. It can be shown to be direct repost to points Paul makes in his, hold on, in his letters to the Romans, exactly. The, the, the letter of James is a direct reply to Paul on Saul of Tarsus. We talk about bridling your tongue and all that, right? A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. That's James talking about Paul. Paul said, the things I'm supposed to do, I don't do. And what I ain't supposed to do, I'm doing. Oh, wretched man that I am. Huh? He's double-minded. He's back and forth. One minute he's saying whoever teach you circumcision let them be let them be castrated the next second he's saying i believe everything written in the law and the prophets <laughs> you know what i mean it's just like so james is responding to what the the foolishness that saul of Tarsus is preaching and teaching out there you see that that's what that's about all right letters to the romans corinthians and galatians even if this is not sufficient to consider it authentic his doctrines are enough like those of the historical James reconstructable from other sources to contend that that it at the very least represents authentic Palestinian tradition. The antiquity of its materials can also now be confirmed by reference to its many parallels to the doctrines in the Dead Sea Scrolls not available previously. It also lacks the Gnostic tendencies so prevalent in later documents featuring the person of James. In it, too, the temple was seen to be still standing and the catastrophe that was soon to overwhelm Jewish life in Palestine has seemingly not yet occurred. At present, opinions concerning this show a greater flexibility and their willingness to come to grips with at least the possibility of its authenticity. Given its manifest parallels with the documents from Qumran, right, that's the Dead Sea, the Qumran, the Qumran community is basically the Dead Sea Scroll community, that's what that's about, all right, 
given this manifest parallels with the documents from Qumran with which it makes an almost perfect fit. Say the letter of James matches right up with the Dead Sea Scrolls. Mm, more history. Yeah. And doctrines are attributable to the person of James from other sources. It has to be considered a fairly good reflection, at least, of the Jamesian point of view. In, in fact, part from the Pauline corpus and the we document on which, as we shall see, the second part of Acts is based. And a few worrisome phrases such as the perfect law of freedom, James 1 and 25 and James 2 and 12. It is one of the most homogenous, authentic, and possibly even earliest pieces in the New Testament corpus or the New Testament body. Ooh, way. Look at this. There are also there are also two apocalypses attributed to James in the Nag Hammadi corpus. I got the Nag. I got the Nag. As well as an additional repost from James to Peter in the prelude to the version of the pseudo Clementines known as the homilies. Now he called the Clementine homilies pseudo. All right. And we know we got the, the homilies and all that. But there is a letter from Peter to James, and Peter's letting it be known in there that James is the the, the bishop and, and high priest of all the camps that are in Yahshua Mashiach. And then Clement write the same thing right behind him. You know what I mean? Of all the church of the Hebrews. I say, dang, look at this. It says right here. Uh, in this last, there are also letters reputedly from Clement to James. That's true. I, I, I show them, you know, every once in a while when we do this, from Clement to James and from Peter to James. I have both of them, all right? There is also a gospel attributed to James, usually referred to as the infancy gospel or the protevangelium of James. I have that too. Averring of all things, the perpetual virginity of Mary. And this is to, but like I used to study with bros that, and we used to always bring the, the proviangelon. We used to call it the proviangelon. The proviangelon of James. And I realized that that, that, that uh, text or well, that literature is purporting that Mary was a perpetual virgin. She always was a virgin. She died a virgin. She had no more children. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of the things that you read, study, you, you need to get into the, the preface, the introduction, look at the sources so you know what you're dealing with. And then you start seeing things. A lot of stuff came hundreds of years later. They're, and they're just adding more and more literature to this what we call this this christian corpus or this christian body of work you did so yeah i got all those though all right uh as will be seen this author might more appropriately have applied this doctrine to james's lifestyle who else to give a better testimony to facts relating to the infant jesus than the person represented as being his older brother but it is most certainly spurious mm. finally finally there is now a lost work known to the writer Epiphanius. I got his too, called the Anabathmoi Jacoba or the Ascents of James. After the lecture, James is pictured as delivering to the Jerusalem masses from the temple steps. Epiphanius even quotes from this work further, further concretizing James's role at the center of agitation in the temple. Huh? James's role at the center of the agitation in the temple opposed to the Herodian priesthood and decrying his pollution. Yeah, ooh -wee, ooh -wee. See, he wasn't with he wasn't with none of that. Got right up in there in your face with it. You did nah 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 ain't none of that finna happen around her. They say Messiah's brother was right in the middle of it. <laughs> James's role at the center of agitation in the temple opposed to the Herodian priesthood and decrying his pollution. Oh, wait. It, it was around this perfectly holy and righteous just one in the temple that in our view, all parties opposing the Herodian Roman establishment from the more violent and extreme to the less so ranged and this role as bishop 
James was also a high priest of the opposition alliance. That's hard. What you mean? So James the just bishop and high priest of the opposition alliance in Jerusalem, boy. What is you saying? That's hard. You dig? Bishop and high priest of the opposition alliance in Jerusalem, Palestine. And you mean to tell me this is Yahshua's brother? We talking historically speaking? Good night, boy. What is we really saying here? He was against all that. These brothers was not laying down and allowing these Romans to come in and do whatever the hell they wanted. They wasn't with it. They wasn't with it. And they was highly dedicated, highly motivated. Mm -hmm. And this role as Bishop James was the James was also the high priest, or was read again in his role, in this role as Bishop James was also high priest of the opposition alliance, thus, in effect, the opposition high priest. Right? So trip off this. No, nah, he wasn't no Levite. The thing is, the Sadducees in them in that day were all Herodians. <laughs> they was all Herodians. You know what I mean? The Herodians had infiltrated the priesthood. You see, the Nazarites, the only brothers who was that dedicated and that holy and just so happened the top Nazarite in his day is James. He the one that's in charge because it wasn't no real priest running on the Temple Mount anyway. They was all Herodians, pro-Roman. So now he wasn't no Levite, just like Yahshua, you know, wasn't no Levite. It did. The fact of the matter is, uh, what we think we we tend to think that the Levites was in in what was in operation, was in administration. Not realizing when you check it through the historical lens, male man, those were Herodians who were appointed by Herod and them to take over the priesthood and officiate. Sad you see is a play on Sadoc. So in effect, this is what happened. Like what you're seeing today, the Herodians was fronting like they was Zadok in them. They were Zadok, Zadokites. <laughs> it was the Herodians. They was the Sadducees. See? So then you had bro and them like, nah, nah, nah. That, that, look, look, the only real ones left, the only real ones left is the ones that's in opposition to what, what Rome is doing. And they got their communities and they out in the desert. You know what I mean? They got somebody called a, the righteous teacher amongst them. It did. So, nah, he wasn't no Levite. The fact of the matter is the priesthood had been infiltrated and uh, polluted, you know what I mean, by the Herodians, who were appointed by the Romans. So, the movement, the, the Nazarene, the same movement, our movement was coming out of the wilderness of Judea. It wasn't, it wasn't you know what I mean, controlled by what was going on in Jerusalem. So, we had our own thing going on. It did. I hope that helped. I hope that helped, brother. Yeah, there wasn't no uh, Levites that was doing the officiating and all that. If it was, they had been demoted down to mopping floors. It did. Now, them Herodians had took over the Sanhedrin, which is the courts, took over the priesthood. You understand? Of course, they was already sitting as kings and ethnarchs and tetrarchs and all that. They had the authority of the Roman Empire to come in and they controlled every key position in ancient Judea, including the priests. So they are, well, all right, well, that's what y'all got going. Our movement, we got the teacher of righteousness over, we got Yahshua, well, he high priest then. That's how that worked. We're not even acknowledging y'all over that way. Look at this right here. It says right here, uh, it says, ultimately, we shall place James at the center of the alliance of all the groups. Look at this. Ultimately, we shall place James at the center of the alliance of all the groups, all the camps, all the congregation, all the groups and parties opposing foreign rule in Palestine and his, con and his con or co co what is it? concomitant foreign gifts and sacrifices on behalf of foreigners in the temple. James and Yahshua and that was uniting the people. Ain't heard nothing about all that. All the, the various factions and different parties and camps and all that, they like, look, who against what the Romans is doing to us? Let's ride. Huh? We don't want your, we don't want your sacrifices up in here. We don't want your gifts. We totally opposed to what y'all doing around here. 
Ultimately, we shall place James at the center of the alliance of all the groups and parties opposing foreign rule in Palestine and is con committing foreign gifts and sacrifices on behalf of foreigners in the temple. The opposition of this alliance to Herodian kings. Look at, listen to this, male man. Sure about this. The opposition of his alliance to Herodian kings and the Herodian priesthood led directly to the uprising against Rome. See that? See? There wasn't no Levites in there. That was that was Herod now. Same people Paul said he related to. I think Paul was able to go right to the right to the high priest and them and get letters to go destroy. I didn't already show Paul Saul of Tarsus his lineage. He a op. He's related bloodline. James and them, I mean, the Messiah's movement, his family, and them, they was totally against the Herodians and the Romans, period. What is we talking about here? And it ain't no coincidence all of them was wiped out. Well, that's who I ride with. I ain't ride with this, these niggas. The rest of these niggas uh, sold out. Whether you're saying Torah only or Messianic Hebrew, because what you got left over was allowed to continue. What they shut down and what they demonized was them zealot brothers, the history known as Sakari, assassination. Those that was going against the Roman Empire and all that. It was, that's that's the spirit they did not want to rise up. You dig? So then you got Josephus, then you got this famous rabbi, Simon Bar, Yohanan, go tell Vespasian that this nigga's the Messiah spoken of in Numbers 24th chapter, 17th verse. He goes back, he go back to Rome, become Caesar, the rabbi gets academies and allowed to, you know, write halakhas and mishnas and reform literature. Rabbin That's where you get your rabbinical Judaism because it was passive and sympathetic toward Rome. It wasn't the bros and them that was riding with the other bros and them out in the wilderness that was like, we rather eat cat shit with a knit needle than bow to you heathens. But that, but them, they was the messianics though. Hmm. They were the ones like, no, nah, uh, Vespasian ain't Mashiach. Y'all crazy. Hmm. That's why I ride it. We ain't ride with those that sold out. So your form of Judaism or Torah only. And, and our form of Messianic Israelite. Because trip off this, when you get down to what we call the body of work called the New Testament, when you tripping off who was writing what first Paul's letters chronologically come before Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Hmm? So there ain't no coincidence either when the New Testament's finally compiled majority of his Paul's letters or Paul boy and them like Luke, them his people. Hmm? What Rome gave you is what was allowed to continue. What they tried to write out of history was the revolutionary messianics that was fighting against them and was like, nah, 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 we ain't going for that. You see, two total different beliefs, two total different movements, all right, two total different views of politics and, and, and spirituality and all of it, all of it. So I ain't really going like, to be trying to argue about, well, I'm not messianic or Torah only, and I'm messianic. Both you niggas is products of niggas that sold out. How about that? How about that? So we can kill the argument right now. Right, and not damn one of y'all came outside and told Vespasian this nigga was Mashiach, uh, prophesied in Numbers twenty four and seventeen. You understand? Then what you got today wouldn't even be around. What is we talking about? The real ones laid it down. That's who I rock with. I ain't rocking with none of that. You know, we gonna be passive or. You know, we're going to play around and we're going to be docile and we just going to, nah, 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 nah. We on it. Look, the least we going to do, now the least we going to do is keep it real first. The least we going to do is open up our mouth and, and, and set fire to the doctrines and the establishment and the false gods that's out here controlling these devils. The least we going to do is speak up. That's the least we going to do. And make you uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to make you uncomfortable. Hmm? Look at this verb. 
It says right here, the uprising, it says the opposition of this alliance to Herodian kings and the Herodian priesthood led directly to the uprising against Rome. This forms the mirror image of the way Christian tradition portrays the messianic individuals it approves of. <laughs> this forms the mirror image of the way Christian tradition portrays the messianic individuals it approves of, who are pictured as sympathetic or at least not antipathetic to Rome. This kind of inversion will be shown to be a consistent aspect of the portraiture and pole mix of this period. Now, here go a coin down here at the bottom. Judea captive coin depicting Emperor Vespasian on obverse and supplying captive Judea on the palm tree on reverse. So this is Vespasian. He said this 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 uh turkey neck heathen right here, Vespasian. They had the nerve to say that he fulfills numbers 24 and 17. What is we really talking about? Look it up. Josephus and Rabbi Simon Bar Yohanan Vespasian fulfills the messianic prophecy. It will blow your mind. And then on the right is either Vespasian or uh, a Roman general pissing on an Israelite that they just captured. Who's sitting up under a willow tree or a palm tree? These are actual coins. These are actual coins. These the this right here is, is archaeology. These coins are in British museums and all that. This right here is this right here is proof that Jerusalem was taken down and captured by Vespasian. And they to, to commemorate it, they many coins. Mm -hmm. And this the Right here, the turkey neck he that they said was Messiah. Come on, man. You can't, you there's no way you can respect this. And he's a Flavian. You get and that's a whole nother topic. You get to how the Flavians was instrumental in composing your literature. You ain't really gonna want you really ain't gonna want to talk to me after that. I'm hit you with something. Constantine, all the way up in the 300s. He was a Flavian bloodline relative as well. Good night, man. I know, I know, I know. Chapter two. Y'all get some understanding so far. Get your brother a five up in the chat. Bless up, bless up, bless up. You dig? Somebody better tell these young boys that I dozed this. Get it done, man. All praise to the creator. We all may know what we're dealing with understand what it is man but it's been a, a very very huge uh mind game psyop let me call it that it's been a very huge psyop that's been conducted against us man you dig and uh me personally it, it pisses me off when i dwell on it too long like dang but it also uh it also uh we don't like the word, but humbles me at the same time, too, because it's like, well, it's a reason why we are allowed to pick up on this information and share it, regardless of who think what about who. Like I saw in that, I'm thankful because it's just like, well, dang, I'm glad I ain't no, you know, just go alone and get along type, you know. You know, don't want to say nothing, don't want to, you know, don't want to disturb the status quo. I ain't never been like that. If I see something, I can't unsee it. I'm going to say something. Drop a bomb in the middle of your <laughs> in the middle of your vacation. What is y'all doing? What are we doing around her? You see, you know y'all get some understanding. We're gonna get into chapter two. We reading James, the brother of Jesus, the Dead Sea Scrolls by Robert Eisenman. All right. Okay, Mel Man, that's what's up, bro. All right, let's get into this. Chapter two. All right, we're going to get into chapter two. The second temple and the rise of the Maccabees. So really, before the Romans, you know, was uh, had us up under their steel boots, it was the Greeks. And this leads right into it. This leads right into the first century, right? This is like the first century of uh, BCE, before the common era. All right, the second temple and the rise of the Maccabees. Salute. 
the Maccabean priesthood with the coming of Alexander the Great in 333. Triple threes. Ooh -wee. BCE, two successive states under Hellenistic kings descended from his generals arose in Asia. One of the Seleucids in Syria and the Ptolemies in Egypt. Judea or Palestine, consisting primarily of the region around Jerusalem proper, swung back and forth under the control first of the former, which are the Seleucids, right? Then of the latter, which are the Ptolemies. As a rule, relations with the more tolerant Greek Ptolemies in Egypt were more cordial than those of the Seleucids, the Seleucids in Antioch. This is important because the independence war which broke out in 167 BCE was pointedly waged against Seleucid Hellenization and intolerance. All right, salute the, hey man, salute the real ones. Salute the real ones, right? Regardless, regardless if we believe in taking up arms and going to war or not, what I salute, you know what I mean? Because everybody ain't cut and built the same way. But what I salute is a man, woman, or a child that's going to stand on what it is they know to be true. Right? Even in the face of death. See, you can't control nobody like that. You got to write somebody like that out of history. You can't allow that type of story to inspire those that come after because that spirit going to be resurrected. So I salute the real ones that was like, we not going for none of that. You did what you're not gonna do is force me to do nothing. That's what you're not gonna do. You dig? So I salute those that ain't it like that because it ain't in some of us just to lay down. Nah, I ain't even to lay down to that. Are you crazy? Nah, I'm good. Right? But see, that type of mindset threatens the powers that be because they need you docile and and uh compromising. You dig? They need you like that for their for, for their machine to run smooth, they need you not to say nothing, shut up, be docile, and compromise with whatever we're talking about. Don't worry about your morals and your standards. Compromise that. Don't make no no. Shh. Use your inside voice. Oh, that's Greek Hellenization and Roman Hell. You know, you understand what I'm saying? Oh, that's Greek Hellenization and Roman romanticism that they done slept us with. Especially us men. Supposed to be a man around her. Somebody all soft smoking, tiptoeing like you tiptoeing through church with your finger up, scared to say something. Nah, nah, nah. That ain't, ain't nothing righteous about that. Stand up and say something. No matter who get offended. So what? They be all right. That's how you gotta be. The war against the Seleucids was led by Judah Maccabee and his real or imagined father, Mattathias. Judah, like Jesus, had three brothers, John, Eleazar, which is a spin on Lazarus, right? Simon, not to mention Judas himself, all names familiar in New Testament usage as well. This war is celebrated in Jewish ritual by Hanukkah, festivities to this day. Hanukkah literally means rededication. That is the rededication of the temple, which was considered polluted by the Seleucids. The struggle surrounding this war went on for some 30 more years until the rise of Simon's son, John Hyacranus, to power, 134 to 104 BC. Look at this. With the attainment of independence, problems associated with being independent, if only 400 years, developed, and the groups and parties that came into prominence and formed the substance of gospel accounts come into focus. In this period, two, the Romans are extending their influence into the Eastern Mediterranean after their victories over the Carthaginians, a Shemitic people along the coast of North Africa and Spain. First Maccabees makes much of Judah friendly correspondence with the Romans. This correspondence is probably authentic, as is another with the Spartans, trip off this, which proudly proclaims that the Jews and the Spartans are related and therefore brothers. Yeah, that's in the Maccabees. Absolutely. Look at this. At first, the Maccabees seem to have affected only the title of high priest. At some point in the first or third generations, however, the title king was adopted. Though the Maccabees were from a priestly family, the question has been raised in the debate relating to the Dead Sea Scrolls, whether they usurped the high priesthood, 
there is no indication whatsoever of such a usurpation and the Maccabees seem to have occupied what appears to have been a very popular priesthood indeed. Josephus, for instance, at the end of the first century in Rome, evinces no embarrassment at the Maccabean blood he claims flowed in his veins. On the contrary, he would appear to be most proud of it. The book of Daniel and Apocalypse, bottom of page six, chapter two, the second temple and the rise of the Maccabees, James, the brother of Jesus, and the Dead Sea Scrolls. I see y'all in the building. Bless up, bless up, bless up. All right, let's keep going. The appearance of the Romans in the Eastern Mediterranean would appear to be referred to at an important juncture of the book of Daniel, where their victory over the Syrian fleet in the Eastern Mediterranean is mentioned as Daniel 11 and 30 through 35. And that occurred roughly 190 before the common era. This seems, in fact, to trigger the predatory activities upon the temple by the Seleucid king Antiochus Epiphanes, the villain of both Daniel and the Maccabee books. Here, too, the book of Daniel uses key terminology of the Kittim, which the Dead Sea Scrolls use to refer to foreign armies invading the country, to refer to the Romans. All right, it's Daniel 11 and 30. This is important for sorting out chronological problems at Qumran. So he like, you really need to understand Daniel, specifically Daniel the 11th chapter. If you want to get your chronological problem, dealing with the Essenes and the Qumran community together, he's saying, look at Daniel. Look at this. Along with Ezekiel and Isaiah, Daniel is perhaps the most important scriptural inspiration for much of the apocalyptic ideology and symbolism of the Dead Sea Scrolls, as well as for the literature of Christianity. Daniel was also, chronologically speaking, one of the what latest books in the scriptural canon, except perhaps for Esther. How many of y'all knew that? Chronologically speaking, Daniel was one of the last books added to the Tanakh. Esther is like the last one. Daniel is the last one, chronologically speaking, just like when you're dealing with the chronological New Testament, you would think Matthew was written first. Really, it was like a uh, Galatians or Corinthians or something like that. One of Paul's letters was well, the same dealing with what you call the Tanakh, the Torah, and then the prophets. Well, the Tanakh, which includes the Torah, one of the last books added to the Tanakh, chronologically speaking, is the book of Daniel. <sighs> oh, wait. Oh, we, it gets deeper and deeper, right? Go to page seven. Daniel's clear association with the Maccabean uprising in Palestine was doubtlessly one of the reasons why the rabbis, following the uprisings against Rome, downgraded it from his position among the prophets, placing it among the lesser writings. So, when you look at like, okay, it's a major prophets and all that certain breakdowns in the front of certain Bibles, they'll break down the major prophets. And according to Robert Iceman, he's saying Daniel used to be a part of the major prophets or on that list. You understand? But it was like after the uprising in Rome, based off its apocalyptic verbiage, it was downgraded to like a lesser prophet or a lesser right. See, what they didn't want to do is make Rome mad again. So these rabbis, these gatekeepers, just like today, these rabbis are gatekeepers. How do you think they got put in position to be a gatekeeper? Huh? Who did they strike a deal with? Oh, wait, you got it. Good old Romans, boy. Look at this right here. Uh, it's right here. No doubt the rabbi saw Daniel as a representative of a new, more vivid style of prophetic expression, which we now call apocalyptic. This style, which they downplayed because of its association with the movement that produced both the Maccabean uprising and the uprising against Rome. The rabbis like, look, that, that apocalyptic literature is dangerous. Damn, they got us wiped out. See what happened with the real ones. The rabbis, man, you dig? He came out here, told Vespasian he was Messiah. And for that, this, this cat gets academies. And as centuries go by, they're allowed to teach and preach what they call their form of Judaism as long as it is not hostile toward Rome and Judaism to this day is not. It's not. 
It's not. So obviously it ain't it ain't the form of Judaism or Hebrewism that the Qumran community, that the, the James community in them was teaching. Obviously, it's totally different. And obviously the, the Christianity as they know it today. Obviously, that's something different because all the ones that that was real was murdered. What survived was the, was what the sellouts came up with. All right, so I'm gonna let y'all have it. That's that's y'all all that. That's all you player. That's all you. Look at this right here. It says, uh, it says, uh, bing, bing, bing. It says this style which they downplayed because of its association with the movement that produced both the Maccabean uprising and the uprising against Rome is very much admired in the documents from Qumran as it is by New Testament writers. In Daniel, prophetical and eschatological motifs concerned with the end times are combined amid the most awe-inspiring and blood-curling imagery. For instance, Daniel is the first document to refer to what might be described as the kingdom of God. God is not only described as enduring forever, working signs and wonders in heaven and on earth and saving Daniel from the power of the lions, that is death, but as having a sovereignty which will never be destroyed and a kingship that will never end. Daniel 6, 26 through 28. But Daniel also evokes the son of man coming on the clouds of heaven. One of the basic scriptural underpinnings for the messiahship of Jesus and a title often applied to. This passage will own the materials relating to James's activities in the temple and the proclamation he makes there. For Daniel, the holy ones, Kedoshim, make war, make war on a foreign invader who has violated and pillaged the temple. This foreigner who has abolished the perpetual sacrifice is clearly anti his epiphanies. Hmm? Daniel 7, 13 through Daniel 8 and 12, the villain of Jewish Hanukkah festivities ever since. Daniel uses additional terms that became popular, particularly at Qumran, but also in the New Testament and the Quran, namely the last days, the wrath, the time of the end, and of course the resurrection of the dead. The way Daniel Mic check, mic check, one, two, one, two. Let me know if I can be heard, family. Let me know. Let me know if I can be heard. Give me a Yahoo up in the chat if I can be heard. Bless up.
Let me know. Let me know. I got two of these cats on it. That's great. Mike check, Mike check, Mike check. Man, that's deal crazy. I don't know what's going on. Okay, there we go. 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 Fam. Let me get back to it. Let me get back to it. Right back at it. All right. Mic check, mic check. Let me know if y'all can hear me. If I can be saying, now what is going on? In this deal, boy. Let me see something. Yeah, we're gonna make them mad. We're gonna deal with the keep dealing with the history on you know, my little taste. You dig? And look, look over here, we ain't afraid to look at nothing. All right, look like we all cool. All right, give me a yeah. What I say, a one. Give me a one up in the chat if I can be heard, family. Give me a one up in the chat. Give me a one. Give me a one. Give me a one. Now right, let's get back to it. I was almost done too. Let's get back to it. All right. See y'all in the building. Create a gang in the building. Nazarites in the building. What's the word, fam? What's the word to be saying? All right. Let's get back to this. Okay, where was I at? No, nah, that ain't the one. Well, I can show this, though, just so everybody can know if you're coming in late. This is the book you're reading out of right here. Very powerful. There's a lot of nukes in this deal. A lot of nukes. You tell whoever got a problem, it ain't nothing but a conversation to be had. That's it. But come on with it, though. Big. Don't think we just gonna sit back and just accept whatever you saying just because you saying it. Nah, you finna have to really put some work in to get some across over this way. All right. Right here. It was the apocalyptic literature, this kind that was seen by the rabbis as the impetus behind the unrest that led to the disaster represented by the first Hebrew uprising against Rome, 66 through 70, and the destruction of the temple and the state, not to mention the second uprising, and that's the Barcoba, Barcoba revolt, 130, that second century, 132 to 136, at a common era bar. And Aramaic means sun, Koba means star, son of the star. Number 24 and 17 is about what? A star coming up out of Israel to rule the nations and, you know what I mean, protect the people. All right. 
So, and so number 24 and 17, the star prophecy was the main driving force behind the war with Rome. It's a messianic prophecy, them brothers that was fighting against that Greek Hellenization and that Roman romanticization was messianics. And the way it's looking, it was led by Yahshua's family. When the dust settled, they give you a refurbished pro-Roman history in Greek. <laughs> that's sympathetic toward Rome. Oh my God, bro, that's crazy. That is crazy. Look at this right here. Uh, it encouraged an extreme zeal for the law, that zealotry associated with holy war, mm. and a willingness to undergo martyrdom rather than to submit to foreign kingship, as well as associated in Peter's towards messianism. You know, yeah, that was so. In other words, that was a messianic war. And you go talking about the rebel rousers who got killed. No, the real ones got murdered. Yeah, them, them soft, them, look, look, the sellout survived. That's who survived. That's what you got today. You got the product of those who sold out. So when somebody like myself stand up and tell you, nah, Jack, y'all looking at that totally wrong. You know what I mean? Somebody stand up like, nah, 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 nah. There's something else going on. You, you're completely overlooking it. And we can prove it. We can use Paul's letters and prove what we're talking about. We, since these ideas were all seen as stemming from the party or parties opposed to what the Pharisee predecessors of the rabbis had represented, that is, seeking accommodation with Rome hmm? Hmm? and foreign powers generally at all costs, they were considered reprehensible. Uh, 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 the opposition, us, those who was against all of it, we were considered reprehensible, even by the quote unquote rabbis who was supposed to have been our people. That's crazy. Look at this right here. It says right here. Uh, they were considered reprehensible. It is therefore understandable that in the version, look at this, it is therefore understandable that in the version of Jewish history, that the rabbis transmitted and in the collection of documents they finally declared to be holy writings at the beginning of the second century CE. Hmm? Books like the Maccabees were set aside and Daniel given the lowest priority. Hmm. Hmm. Really? Let's get into your boy. Let's get into your man's in them. Your boy Josephus. You gotta look, you gotta look at him too with a John Desido. Anything ain't right with him either. <laughs> anything, anything ain't right with him either. No way. No way. Let's get into it. The Jewish historian Josephus. Josephus, 37 common era to 96 common era, is important for a consideration of this whole period. Without him. We will, be all, we will be almost completely ignorant of events. Now, I find that not a coincidence. You mean to tell me it really ain't that much first century history? Josephus, Dead Sea Scrolls, and maybe Philo. You think that's a coincidence? He's a Flavian. You think that's a coincidence? All our literature getting coming out of the court to the Flavians. It's, man, it's a reason why you, when you reach back, that's a really, I mean, dealing with the times of the first century and all that is it's very limited. Uh, that's crazy. And even that got to be looked at and scrutinized. With him, we have a marvelous insight into an almost encyclopedic reportage of what transpired. From 62 CE onwards, the year of James' death as recorded in the Antiquities, Josephus was a mature observer relying on his own experience and eyewitness reporting. His personal experience are in fact incorporated in great detail into the book called The Jewish War, which he wrote directly after the events of 66 through 73, right after the fall of Jerusalem and which ends significantly enough with the description of the triumphal parade in Rome of Titus, the son of the new emperor Vespasian. 
mm, 69 through 79. All right. Shout out to my brothers, uh, Cosmo and Kyle and Sheila Shalom. They brought this book out called Antiquity Unveiled. All right. And it's interesting to find out about a cat named uh, Apollyana of Tiana and how he was actual Vespasian's oracle. <laughs> I say, man, you can't make this stuff up, man. Like, how deeper can it get? He was Vespasian's oracle. Like, straight up, like, his, his go-to guy to consult with the spirits. Good night, man. <laughs> That's crazy. But look at this. Josephus, as a member of the latter staff, Josephus was a member of Vespasian's staff. He was adopted into the Flavian family. That's why he's called Flavius Josephus. Josephus, as a member of the latter staff, witnessed this event. The, commem the commemorative Arch of Titus still stands in the ruins of the Roman Forum today. A chilling reminder of these age-old cataclysms. <laughs> But Josephus was also a turncoat, a traitor to his people. Absolutely. When reading him, this should always be kept in mind. Remember, I'm reading the memoirs of a snitch. <laughs> That's just what it is. You understand? So that means there's an agenda there, too. There's an agenda there, too. You know what I mean? And whosoever agenda he's keeping up, that they got to be considered. Why wouldn't it be that of Caesar? who he said was the Messiah coming out of Palestine in Numbers 24 and 17. Why wouldn't it be? Right? So look at this. When reading him, this should always be kept in mind. It was on the basis of this betrayal that he was allowed to live and was not put to death like others who played a role in the events he describes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're reading the memoirs of a snitch, man. <laughs> a straight turncoat. Uh, but... What he, what he put down is valuable. Just like Saul of Tarsus, he a op, but his letters are valuable. Without them, you like you real short in what you got. You dig? So now keep all that there. You need to read all that. And you, you can start making you know, proper judgments on what's going on. Dang, man, this is crazy. Right? Look at this right here. It says, uh, but Josephus was also a turncoat, a traitor to his people. When reading him, this should always be kept in mind. It was on the basis of this betrayal that he was allowed to live and was not put to death like others. Hmm? Because you betrayed your people, you were allowed to live. Who played a role in the events he describes. For Josephus, for Josephus did play a role in these events. Originally, by his own testimony, he was military commander of Galilee. Commissar might be more accurate, responsible for its organization and fortification in the early days of the revolt. Later, after his desertion, he was an interrogator of prisoners. This nigga, this nigga's a straight man. Come on, man. So not only did you betray your people when you got in good with the Flavians and all them, now you interrogating the bros, nigga, that you was over here leading. You interrogating the captured bros that was that, that was fighting against what it was. So you got to, you know, even when you read him, you got to be like, yeah, because because it really ain't no telling, you know, what I mean, like like how much he's being monitored. Look at this. His popularity among his fellow countrymen can be deduced from the following episode, which he describes in the Jewish war deputized by the Romans. Look at that. Deputized by the Romans, just like them, 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 them monkey ass niggas that jumped on my brother Tyree Nichols. Deputized by the state, huh? Deputized by the Romans, presumably because he spoke the native language to call up to the defenders on the walls of Jerusalem during his siege and ask for their surrender. He was hit on the head by a projectile thrown by someone on the battlements. Good. <laughs> Good. Their enemy, Josephus, had been wounded. Uh, and that's the, uh, the the Hebrew War. That's Book Five. You know, with military commanders or commissars like Josephus, the Jews had no need of enemies, and the military catastrophe that overtook them was inevitable. Later, he uses the prestige his priestly status allowed him in the eyes of the Romans to appeal to their credulity. 
and the exaggerated awe they felt for such augurs or foreign oracles. That's the war 6, 310 to 15. It was the, his role as a fortune telling Jewish priest. Uh oh. Uh oh. Look at this. It, it was to his role as a fortune telling Jewish priest, supposedly held in high esteem by his own people, that his survival can be credited. He and several companions had taken refuge in a cave after the collapse of the military defense of Galilee, for which he was uh, ostensibly responsible. Dang. The Romans were taking this time honored route on their way to lay siege to Jerusalem. And Josephus betrayed the suicide pact. See, they agreed, like, look, if we lose, we're going to commit suicide. A lot of them, that's how zealous they were. They was like, look, our bodies belong to the creator. You understand? We'll Look, we'll fall on our own swords before we allow ourselves to be captured alive by these unclean Romans. See, it's a, it's, it's a different mindset. It's a different uh, uh, ideology. It's a different thought. You can't deal with nothing like that. What you got today, Torah only, uh, you know what I mean, uh, Judaism, all that are the byproducts of sellouts who came outside and told Vespasian, look, I ain't radical like my brothers and them. Them niggas is crazy. Uh, you are Messiah. You spoken about in our prophecies. Uh, anything I can do, you understand, to give the city over to you to expedite this, I'm willing to do it. And that's what happened. And for their loyalty to the Vespa, to the Flavians, the rabbi, again, Rabbi uh, Simon Bar Yohanan and Flavius Josephus, they were rewarded. The rabbi was given academies to continue his passive form of Judaism that was pro-Roman. And not hostile toward Rome like the bros and them that let that that laid it down that the Messiah's family actually was leading. They were the leaders of the whole movement. Right? And dealing with your boy. What's your boy name for ladies? Josephus. You dig? He came outside, told old boy that he was uh Messiah according to number 24 and 17. And he was adopted into the family. He became a Flavian. <laughs> He got this citizenship and I was like, man, good night, man. This is crazy. Then that's what survived. Pauline Christian, or Paul's version or Paul's movement for the quote unquote Christian side. And what you got today is rabbinical Judaism with your Talmuds, with your Mishnahs, with your Halakha, with all your, you know, rolling your R's and Talmud, ta the Talmud. Like your seats seats and all that, all that was all that comes from, or was allowed by Rome because it was considered non-combative. It wasn't what the real ones was on, which is what you know. What I mean, I mean, I watched this right here. <laughs> Look at this right here. It says, uh, "It says right here, Josephus betrayed the suicide pact that he and a few companions had made." the normal zealot approach in such extreme circumstances. Instead, he and another colleague after dispatching their comrade surrendered to the Romans. An episode he relates quite shamelessly. Like, he ain't even ashamed. He like, yeah, you know, so so we all agreed. We we all was planning to fall on our swords. Everybody fell on their swords that me and my boy right here. We stopped in the middle of them. It was like, no, nah, we cool. <laughs> Look at this. Ushered into the Roman commander Vespasian's presence, Josephus proceeded to apply the messianic star prophecy to him. There it is. Prophesying that Vespasian was the one foretold in Jewish scripture, Hebrew scripture, who was going to come out of Palestine and rule the world. This was the prophecy that was of such importance to resistance groups, groups like James that was leading him and his community. This was the prophecy that was of such importance to resistance groups in this period, including those responsible for the documents at Qumran, that's the Dead Sea Scrolls, y'all, and the revolutionaries who triggered the war against Rome, not to mention the early Christians. The following year, Vespasian was to replace Nero as emperor. Bad drop. What are we saying? They saying that numbers 24 and 17. Right, I'm going to read the rest of this right here, the rest of page eight, and then we're going to go to numbers. We're going to show it. We're going to show it. 
So, you know what I mean? You, we can save all that with me, whether you uh, a Sunday Christian or a Messianic Israelite or a non-Messianic non -messianic Israelite, rabbinical Judaism, Torah only, whatever. What we have are the byproducts or the results of the ones that sold out to say they own skin, y'all. That's what that is. What are we even arguing about? Right? And then the brothers who really was fighting you understand the bros who really was messy and the bros who was like nah we ain't bowing to none of that we rock with creator and creator only what you mean that was the ones that was murdered it was them but look you you frown on them and call them sacrilegious and zealots they was the rebel rousers them was the ones that was them was the real niggas them was the real ones right there boy that's who the world forgot about. Right? We're here to remind you. We're here to remind you. Look at this. Of course, Josephus was not the only turncoat, the only traitor, the only sellout. Of course, Josephus was not the only turncoat to whom sources attribute reversing the sense of the Messianic prophecy, applying it to the destroyer of Jerusalem instead of to its liberator. The rabbis. Who became the Roman tax collectors in Palestine after the fall of the temple claimed the same behavior for the progenitor of the form of Judaism they followed, rabbinic Judaism to be Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai. They here right there. I was calling him something different. Simon ben the boy. Now his name is Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai. Look him up. Look them up, it'll blow your mind. Dang, that's crazy. So you mean in the war, you got your turncoats too. Like, in other words, these are these Josephus and Rabbi Yohan and Ben Zakai would have been the ones that sold Nat Turner out. They would have been the ones that sold Denmark Vesey out. Hmm? That's what you have. What you have are their children. Good night, boy. You don't do you see? Are y'all starting to see the psyop, the psychological operation, the mind game that's been played on us? Y'all true about this strictly with the composition of literature. And don't look and please don't tell me that it's impossible when you take classes like English comp in, in high school and college. They're teaching you how to compose literature in English. It's a skill. It's something that must be learned. Hmm? These cats came outside and told this boy Vespasian, this turkey neck heathen, that he was, that he was Messiah, man. Bag drop. Y'all ain't talking about nothing. Y'all better leave the creative gang alone, period. Y'all better leave these Nazarites alone. I'm telling you, y'all not ready. Y'all not ready. Not ready. Not with the, not with all this hanging over your head, you not. Every Negro that's running around here claiming that he's black and Jewish, wearing yarmulkes and zitzits and and, and 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 mantles and and then trying to talk like these. Man, look, you should be ashamed of yourself. You should be ashamed of yourself. Cause you ain't doing them becoming the same vibration the sellouts came in things came in that man that's what survived that's what you have you think it's a game that the same torah portions the non-messianic or the messianic brothers is doing every sabbath the the the, the white jews are doing the same exact torah portion you think that's a, a, a coinky dink they've been in league yeah, yeah, yeah. They've been the gatekeepers for the Roman Empire. What you mean? What you think? Yeah, yeah, you think Kanye was tripping when he said they control the black experience? You think that's a game? How did they get set up as the gatekeepers? What did the origin go back to? You don't even know the Herodian or Roman. You understand? Plot. That's been there the whole time to keep you docile as a slave. You don't even want to whisper some of the stuff I'm saying. You dare not whisper it. 
Uy. Uy. <laughs> this is crazy. Look at this right here, man. This is right here. It said, of course, Joseph was not the only turn coat to whom sources attribute reversing the sense of the messianic prophecy, applying it to the destroyer of Jerusalem instead of to his liberator. The rabbis who became the Roman tax collectors in Palestine after the fall of the temple claim the same behavior for the progenitor of the form of Judaism they followed, rabbinic Judaism to be, Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai. Look him up. They is. Rabbi Yohannes seems also, seems also, mm -hmm. Look at this. to have been involved in the process of fixing the Hebrew canon at the end of the first century. Oh, what you mean fixing it? <laughs> you know, that's what I'm saying. All of us are victims of the translators. Jack, when you done talking. What is you arguing about when you're dealing with text that was fixed, redacted, touched on by sellouts? Huh? Because they ain't want to piss Rome off again like your messianic brothers and sisters who refuse to bow to Rome. Girl, they come redacting and hushing up and using your inside voice and walk around with a, with a crooked back with a one-up tiptoeing through church. That's the spirit you in. That's the type of time most y'all is on. You ain't really about none of this because you scared to stand up and tell the masses what it is that you seeing, you studying. A lot of you brothers, I personally done taught over the years. But look, if you look, if you afraid to be real with yourself, you ain't about no truth. Sit your ass down somewhere. What kind of truth you about? Scared to stand up and tell your little camp leader or your congregation leader they going off. Nigga, we ain't talk about this. Mally been over here two years to calling all y'all out like, what's up? What's good? Quiet on the set, huh? I know. That's what I'm saying. So if you know your brother been calling your leaders and your elders out and they quiet on the set, then at what point do something click in you and say, you know what, let me go get with the art real quick to see what he's talking about, man, because these niggas quiet over here. Hmm? Either because they don't know or they do know and they ain't trying to lose what it is they didn't gain over these years, which is if you ain't willing to lose nothing for the sake of truth, sit your ass down again. You ain't about no truth. You scared to lose. That's how you know it's really about self. It really ain't about the embedment of, the, of everybody around you. It's about self. If you afraid to tell the masses like, hey, look, uh, we may be going the wrong way. The reason why I thought we were supposed to be going this way because I got bad directions or whatever. I just got the right ones. We got to get off at the next ramp, bust an ugly, get back on the freeway, and get on back down to the exit. We missed our exit 10 miles back. That's the type of brother I am. I'm going to come out and tell you, hey, hold on. Hey, look, look, look. This is what's going on. I'm not going to sit here and act like I don't know we lost. So for any of y'all listening, I done called your elders out, all of them, from St. Louis to New York to Cali to over in Jerusalem. I done called all y'all out. And either y'all going to be real and have a conversation or y'all not. But if you sitting up under the kneecaps of these men I done called out and 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 they and you seeing they quiet as church mouse. They look, even if they respond, they ain't trying to respond to where they both can go back and forth and have a dialogue in front of everybody. You did. If you seeing that and you still sitting up under that, under that shame on you, be a man and let them drag black. Get up and come holler. You did. And let's go ahead and see what's what. Look at this right here, man. Look at this right here. It said this cat was involved in the process of fixing the Hebrew canon at the end of of the first century so toward like the 90s and close to the you know the 80s and the 90s end of the first century that same rabbi who told vespasian that he was messiah was given an academy and he was in charge he's and he was involved in the process of fixing the hebrew canon what you mean fix it was it broke or something 
Uh, so now you're dealing with scribes, redactions, additions, you know, all at the behest of who's ever controlling the narrative. Hmm? Like Hillel and Shammai before him with Harad, Rabbi Yohanan's behavior with the Romans has become uh, paradigmatic. Paradigm, paradigmatic, I guess is how you say that. He is described in rabbinic sources as applying the same star prophecy, the most precious prophecy of the Hebrew people at that time, to the conqueror of Jerusalem, Vespasian. You sell out ass, nigga, man. I ain't got no love for these cats. None who was elevated to supreme ruler of the known civilized world after his military exploits in. Palestine. Good night, boy. Good night. Let's read that prophecy real quick. We almost done. We only got like two more pages. Let's see if we can read some of that. Let me, let me put this on right here. You know, y'all can see that. Let's go to numbers. This is the this prophecy I'm going to show y'all is the prophecy that was fueling the war against Rome. Okay, it's in Numbers 24. It's called the Star Prophecy. Right, and, and and that was what fueled the last revolt. The last Hebrew revolt was called the uh, Bar Koba revolt. Bar is Aramaic for sun, Koba means star, son of the star. If you remember, you had turncoats telling this boy Vespasian that he was, that this prophecy you're about to read applies to him. And they did that to, to, to uh, protect their scheme. Number 24, I'm going to start at 16. All right, it said, he have said, which heard the words of God and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty fall into a trance, but having his eyes open. I shall, look at this, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not near. There shall come a star out of Jacob. Hmm? Josephus and that rabbi said that star that comes out of Jacob is Vespasian Caesar. Vespasian or Flavius, Flavius Vespasian. What survived? Rabbinic Judaism and Paul's movement, you know, today is Gentile or Hellenistic Christianity. That's what survived. They say that Vespasian fulfills this right here. <laughs> so you can't tell me you ain't dealing with sellouts. It's impossible. It's impossible. Look at this. And a scepter, you know, there's something in the ruler's hand, shall rise out of Israel and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Shem. And Edom shall be a possession. Seir also shall be a possession for his enemies. And Israel shall do valiantly. Out of Jacob shall come he that shall that shall have dominion and shall destroy him that remaineth of the city. So instead of that being the liberator of Jerusalem, they saying that's the destroyer. And that's Vespasian Caesar, the messianic zealots who was like, nah, 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 nah. We ain't that ain't him, and we have never bowed to him. That was the brother that was murdered. That prophecy right there, verse 17, this is the prophecy that was fueling the whole war. But that's a messianic prophecy. Instead of, instead of going out like a real one, shit, they turned coat and said, oh, no, that's uh, that's you, Vespa. That's you, Master. Is we sick, boss? Is we sick, huh? Wait. Look at this right here. As the rabbinic presentation of the story goes, Rabbi Yohanan, after having himself smuggled out of Jerusalem in a coffin. <laughs> Look at this, man. Hold on, man. <laughs> Hold on. He oh, snuck the nigga out of Jerusalem in a coffin, man. Look at it. Quite appropriately, as it turns out, besides it was the only exit possible at the time. Had an arrow shot in the best patient's camp, attached to which was a note claiming that Rabbi Yohanan is one of the emperor's friends. Doubtless this was true, but the camp had to have been Titus because Vespasian, the founder of the new Flavian line of emperors, had already gone to Rome at this point to assume his crown. 
even Titus behind to win th to wind things up in Palestine. Rabbi Yohanan, as Talmudic materials present him, then had himself ushered into Vespasian's presence to proclaim the very same thing Josephus recounts he did that Vespasian was the ruler prophesied to come out of Palestine and rule the world. Backdrop. What is we saying? What is we saying? And you wonder why you got uh, verses in, in the literature, in the New Testament, where, where those who's against Messiah say, we have no king but Caesar. I see. I see. I see. I see. Oh, okay. Okay. So what y'all done did was present us y'all own Messiah. Caesar's Messiah. Good night, boy. And totally destroyed the legacy of the Messianic Revolutionary family. It did who was all murdered by the Herodian Roman establishment. Totally destroyed that legacy. Totally destroyed his relationship with his family and all that. To where there's no even when you ask, true about this, when you ask a devout Christian or even a, a Israelite, especially those that believe in the virgin birth, you ask any of them and say, Yeah, you know, James was Jesus had a brother named James. Jesus had many brothers and sisters, but one of them was named James. They'll look at you like you was crazy. Because the masses at large, no, look, I grew up in church. Oh, we I was a teenager. We never talked about the fact that Jesus had brothers and sisters ever. It was never, it was never even brought up. It was never even brought up. <laughs> Whether Josephus was a cynical opportunist or not, his account is the more credible. Though both may be true. If so, Vespasian must have become very impatient of all these Jewish turncoats obsequiously fawning on him and proclaiming him the ruler foreseen in Jewish scripture who was to come out of Palestine to rule the world. Or maybe he didn't. For his part, the Romans accorded Rabbi Yohanan the academy. Look at this. This nigga is hooked up with a university. Hmm? Guess what? That academy is pro-Roman. Huh? It is not hostile toward Rome like the Messianic zealots, the Messianic Essenes, the zealots, Nazarenes. No, it's not that. This is totally different. So when you hear people today talking about the, the, the law, the guy keeps the law. I mean, look, look, stop it. You ain't Judge Dredd around her. You ain't keeping nam bit of Torah nor nam bit of understanding like the, the real ones, like Yashu and his family. That form of law keeping is what got them murdered. What you got today is never a threat to the Roman establishment. What you got today is what got the Jewish, who you call the Jewish folks in the position of being doorkeepers and gateway keepers. They're still the tax collectors or the doorkeepers or the gatekeepers to the Roman Empire to this very day. To this very day. Oh, wait. All right, so for his part, the Romans accorded Rabbi Yohanan the Academy at Yavne, where the foundations of what was to become rabbinic Judaism was laid. <sighs> Whereas Josephus was adopted for services rendered, right, in the Jewish war being one of them into the Roman imperial family itself. What they do this at? That's why I always thought Josephus was Paul or Saul of Tarsus. I always thought that. It didn't sound too familiar. In Josephus' case, the contracts for his treachery had already been laid some time before. As he recounts it, he knew someone in the Roman camp, someone he had met on a previous mission to Rome on behalf of some obscure priest, who he contends were being held on a trifling charge of some kind. These priests, like Paul, according to Acts, had appealed to Nero and were probably connected in some manner to the temple warfare. And this affair, which in our view led directly to the death of James, a wall had been built presumably by zealot priests to block Agrippa II from viewing the temple sacrifice while reposing and eating on the balcony of his palace. In his autobiographical excursions appended to the antiquities called the Vita, Josephus describes how as a young priest, he went to Rome on a mission to rescue those who had gone there and been detained as a result presumably of the temple warfare. 
somehow he had gained access to a well-connected Jewish actor. Look at this. Somehow this is secret. Somehow he had gained access to a well-connected Jewish actor to Nero's wife, Papia, whom he elsewhere described as being interested in religious causes. Jewish or otherwise, it will be remembered that Nero too enjoyed the company of people of the theater. So pleased was Papia with the young Josephus that he apparently attained all he wished of her and perhaps more. For he proudly bragged that she sent him away laden with gifts. One wonders what else the artful young priest managed to achieve during his stay, apart from the contacts he made in Roman intelligence circles mm, that served him so well when the Roman armies finally did appear in Galilee three years later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, that's. That's what I'm saying. Like Josephus' whole history is suspect too. You know what I mean? Suspect. Look at this. Josephus was obviously then very well placed to produce his accounts of the history of Palestine and matters such as the rise of the Flavians and their qualifications either for Jewish messiahship or divine honors. Hold on. Hold on. Let's read that again. Josephus was obviously then very well, very well placed to produce his accounts of the history of Palestine and matters such as the rise of the Flavians and their qualifications either for Jewish messiahship or divine honors, as the case may be, for which he was duly rewarded. In writing the Jewish war, for instance, he was putting the Flavians on the same level as the forerunner of the previous dynasty, the divine Julius. The only difference was that whereas Julius Caesar wrote his own histories, Josephus, an adoptee and a captive, wrote theirs. Some ain't right. Some ain't right. It's page 10 right here. This Joe, that's what I'm saying. I don't even think Joseph. I think Josephus was a straight Flavian out the gate. You know what I mean? Flavian, Flavian, and a Herodian connected. And that's how he would know the Jewish history or the Hebrew history. He, I could just look at him. He, look, that's Josephus right there to the left. He don't look like a brute at all. I know it's deeper than looks and all that, but that, that your boy is right there. Look at that. Josephus is inaccurate when it comes to matters having a direct bearing on his own survival. In particular, his questionable relations with revolutionaries, apocalyptic groups, and sedition, as well as his attempts to ingratiate himself with his new masters. But his meticulous reproduction of the uh, minute of day-to-day -day events is unparalleled. For this reason, we have an encyclopedic presentation of events and persons in Palestine in this period without equal in almost any time or place up to the era of modern record keeping and reportage. See that? Point of Antiochus Epiphanes, that's Antiochus Epiphanes, the Greek. Now look at him, next, and he's supposed to be an Israelite word. Look at Josephus' side view and Antiochus Epiphanes. Sure it ain't the same one? Sure, it ain't the same guy. Look at that. I don't even think Josephus was an Israelite. I think dude was a Herodian just like Paul. And the Herodians, because of their close, their close proximity to Torah, they know all the history. Easy work. That's Josephus right there to the left. That's Antiochus Epiphany corner him to the right. So this is historical. All right. Presumed bus of presumed bus of the Jewish historian Josephus. This is Pompey right here to the right, right Pompey who stormed the temple in 63 BCE. Mm -hmm. and below the Maccabean tombs and Moden. Told y'all the real ones died, man. Laid it down. Sellouts was who lasted. And uh, the next class we do, we're going to jump into chapter three, Romans, Herodians, and Jewish sex. All right.
That's where we're going to start. We're going to read chapters three and four. All right. Next go around. So it was an honor chopping it up with the fam today. All praises to the creator. Believe that. I got to finish my day off. Finish strong. Get a few things done. You did. But it's good to be in the building. It's good to get on here and chop it up with the fam. Believe that and know that. Nazarene edition part 105, history verse literature part two, the Palestinian background. All right. And uh that's where the study's been at. Right. It's giving our people uh, you know, for those who for those who are curious and want to deal with your history through a historical lens and not this necessary literature. Yeah, it's a whole nother storyline out there. <laughs> Excuse me, sir. You dropped your bag. <laughs> bag drop. Jaja boy G.I.T. Salute to my Nazarites. Shout out to the creative gang gang in the building. I see the creative gang in the building. Bless up. Bless up. Big homie in the building. Big homie in the building. It's the word, King. Bless up. Bless up. Bless up. Dreadful Cosmine in the building. Ray Ray Yah, boy. Well, you look like an ascended master on that one, boy. That, boy, that must be an avatar or something. You look like an ascended master. <laughs> Yah, Ray Yah done got the title of Lord already, boy. Ooh, wait. All praise and glory. Now, if y'all got some understanding up in the chat, man, give your brother a nine up in the chat. Give me a nine up in the chat if y'all got some understanding. All right. Again, there's a difference between history. History, this is what we're going over today. Robert Iceman, James, the brother of Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls, the historical James, Paul, the enemy, Jesus' brothers as apostles. Wait till we get to that part right there. About, about his brothers, his family being his apostles. Oh, way. Yeah, 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 yeah. A lot of his post-war flavor is a lot of his Flavian post-war literature meant to make docile the revolutionary spirit of the messianic movement that was coming out of Palestine. You know what I mean? Our people. Right? And the real ones ain't making it up. The real ones died in it. Those that survived, guess what they had to do? Vespasian, Flavius Vespasian. You was you are not only Caesar, but Messiah. There's prophecy in our scriptures about you. We what survives? Sellouts. But didn't survive the real ones. So salute the real ones. I salute you all in the name of the credit. Okay, I see y'all in the building. All right. Well, look, I'm about to get up out of here, man. I got some more stuff I gotta do. You know, dang, we almost was on that four hours, huh? That was so I played a video for the first 40 something minutes. So yeah, I Man, we are about three hours. Time is flying. I'm about to get out of here. I love y'all. You dig indeed and in truth. And uh, as I continue to pray for y'all, y'all continue to pray for me. Set set those good intentions on one another. Good intentions. You understand? Good news. Blessings. You understand? And uh, if you're in close proximity, make sure you put that put that heart chakra on somebody and hug on them. You know what I mean? Let them know you love them. Look them in their face. You dig? Let them know you deserve for them. That right there done talked a lot of people off the ledge. You dig? That's, we, that's what we're here to do. We're here to bust, bust open a few hills and shine some of this ethereal light. You understand? It's time to wake up. So good seeing y'all. Good to be seen. Thank y'all for y'all prayers. Thank y'all for y'all support. You understand? Uh, and stand strong, if not anything else. Shout out to the haters, y'all jackers and naysayers. We love y'all too. And eventually, when y'all get the testicular fortitude of a squirrel, maybe one of y'all come holler so we can go ahead and put all this to bed. You understand? Because we ain't the ones that's confused. We, like it's, it's real easy to show. It's real easy to present. Um, we can start with the bottom. We start there. You dig? And then once you see everything else is that's stacked up, including the history. Dig. There ain't nothing else to talk about after that. But dang, I ain't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So salute the real ones. You understand? Create a gang. You bring them. We praise them. Salute the Nazarites. Salute their saints. Those that stay solid. 
Those that say solid. Some of you Negroes is funny acting and funny looking, if you ask me. It did. But salute the Nazarites and salute their scenes, the real ones. The ones that stay solid. And, they, and don't spill their coffee because they hear a word like chakra. Y'all ain't on no type of level. If y'all still getting offended over a word like chakra, you ain't on no type of levels ever concerning nothing. You understand what I'm saying? So see y'all, you understand, in a few days, most I willing. Love y'all indeed in truth. Uh, continue to pray for one another, love on one another. You understand? Because if the world hates you, you understand? Know that they hated all the real ones that came before us first. Right? And because we are so hated by the masses, we are love one another. Love each other hard. I may get on your nerves at times. I know I do. Uh, I get on everybody's nerves. But you be all right. You be all right. We had a long time to be around each other. Y'all do realize that. Very, very long time. You dig? So love all y'all. Handle y'all business. I salute you all in the love and light of the creator. You dig? Bless up. Don't hurt nobody. Love is love. Y'all.